Again, this is Joe Dennis, the Vice President, Chief Technical Officer of Surface Tech. I will be your moderator today for today's webinar. Uh, you will be receiving two hour uh, PDH credits. That will come in a follow up email as an attachment, a certificate, as well as a recording of today's session. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce the President of Surface Tech, Mr. Steve Santa Cruz, that has a message for the entire audience today. Steve? Thank you, Joe. So welcome to Surface Tech's sponsorship of an exciting three-part series on asphalt technologies presented by Phil Blankenship of Blankenship Asphalt Tech and Training of Richmond, Kentucky. For those who don't know, Phil is one of the most highly respected stewards of our industry with a long and defined background in all things pavement, and now is uniquely positioned to help. He's even opened up a new state-of-the-art test facility, fondly called the Bat Lab, enabling him and his team to help tackle the serious pain points plaguing long life pavements. You're in for a treat and likely will come away learning something new about something very old. We have a big international audience today and very much appreciate the attendance. I'd like to think it's because of the content, but know the containment plays a big part. In any event, thank you for your time and interest. We're confident you'll appreciate the presentation and content. And on that note, just a reminder to everyone to keep up the good social disciplines that are our new norm. The distancing, hand washing, and proper PPE are critical to keep embracing as flattening the COVID curve is the order of the day. Hopefully, by doing so, we can soon begin our re-entrance to what surely will be a new business interfacing of tomorrow. And like many on the session today within their own companies, Surface Tech stands strong as a leading new technologies manufacturer and supplier that has readied itself appropriately to address the needs in this difficult period and beyond. We stand strong and at the ready with ample inventories and surfaceability at plant sites for now is our season start. We're proud of our folks and their disciplines to get the job done right the first time and help our fellow contractors in that same manner. As Surface Tech's president, I have a privilege of leading a team of innovation-minded associates and affiliates through the maze of our industry standards that account for embrace of new technologies, as much art as science. But the science is what allows the art to be tempted, ultimately then specified and normalized. And at Surface Tech, we have worked hard and invested significant dollars and time ensuring for our product efficacies. We take the science seriously. Today's session will be moderated by Surface Tech v Vice President CTO Joe Dennis. Joe is a champion and original steward of our technologies and a great advocate for our industry as well. He's a solid contact for all of you moving forward with not only our platform, but the industry's newfound direction. It's time we all rode together in a better unified fashion to solve our ever-growing pain underfoot and under wheel. So, fill your cup or ergonomically correct water container, tighten that rope belt and kick off those slippers. If you hear that roar in the background, it's the Batmobile revving up at the starting line. Joe, our moderator, take the reins and get us started. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate that. Um, and yes, uh, thanks for everybody coming uh, and attending today. Uh, very different time for all of us. We realize uh, we're really excited to uh, be able to put this webinar together for really people all over the world. Uh, and so uh, very excited about moderating this and introducing our presenter. Bill, next slide. But before we get started, There'll be some features in this presentation today uh, that are called poll questions. And uh, to get us started and to help uh, everybody attending learn how to use uh, the poll questions, uh, I have one here to get us started. And I think you'll be uh, surprised of the answers of those on the call. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll question. And Oh, 
So the question is to all of you in attendance, where in the world are you connecting today for this webinar? Go ahead and uh, vote if you would, and I will uh, show the results here in a little while, in about a minute. Uh, while this is uh, getting uh, answered, Bill Blankenship is readying himself in uh, his virtual lab, I'll call it, because uh, he is uh, uh, down in the Richmond lab today. We call that the Bat Lab, and uh, he'll be uh, taking the reins here shortly. We have about 90% uh, about of the voters in now, attendees. I'll give it a couple more seconds. I'm going to close this and it should bring it back up. Share. There we go. So, we do have people from all over the world attending today, with uh, really uh, USA and Canada almost being split in half. So, the nearly 300 people on the call today are coming from all over the world. And we just thank you for your time. Uh, we thank you for your attention. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to and introduce Mr. Phil Blankenship. Phil uh, has, uh, was exposed to our product line in 2016, well, where he was uh, working for the Asphalt Institute in, uh, in Kentucky, um, and has quickly become not only a steward of our technology, but a trusted consultant, advisor, and a mentor to our uh, company. So we're very, very uh, excited for Phil to get up and show you uh, everything he knows about asphalt, which is extensive, and why he's such an important partner, partner to myself and Surface Tech. So as you see here, we call him the Batman, and he runs his organization at the Bat Lab in Richmond, Kentucky. With that, Phil, I'm going to turn it over to you, my friend. Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's doing doing well. Um, I, uh, I I know how it is to do these webinars, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do a quick just a web view here, uh, or a cam view, <laughs> so that uh, everybody can see that I am uh, <clears throat> alive and 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 well here. So this is uh, I'm sitting here in Richmond, Kentucky. I've got my headgear on and all this, so this is not a pretty thing to look at all day long. So I'm gonna turn that back off. But uh, just so you know, this is uh, this is not pre-recorded or anything. This is live. And um, thank you guys for the introduction. Um, I was uh, I was getting a kick out of it. Uh, uh, the, the whole Batman thing. Uh, it, it's funny when you start off with something like that and and an idea, and you and you come up with a company name. And and um, one thing I really I love inventing, but I love to have fun as I'm going along. Because if you don't enjoy your your uh, your life's work, uh, there's something wrong. So. Uh, absolutely love what I'm doing and, and and appreciate Surface Tech very much today for offering this platform and offering up uh, the, the features of WebEx that I, or not WebEx, <laughs> go to webinar that I can go out there and do this today. And so thank you guys at Surface Tech. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Joe, for the introductions. And I want to tell everybody uh, a little bit about what we're going to be, <clears throat> what we're going to be doing today. Um, as we as we get into our, our webinar uh, and, and we look at the outline, uh, this, this is going to move you through. This is going to be uh, uh, fast paced, so you know, sit down there and, and sit back, buckle up, and understand if you got to run and take a, a biological break or whatever you may have to do. But uh, during this time, there's going to be poll questions, there's going to be interactions, but we're going to move through these this slide bank pretty quickly. Probably about the slide about uh, every um, <clears throat> about every 45 seconds once we get going. What, we're, what this is meant to do today is not to give you a, a, a deep understanding, but this is really focused to give you a high level understanding of um, asphalt materials, of aggregate uh, that's used in the, in the design, 
how we actually go in and design the, the mixtures today in, in using uh, that in, in what we call super paid volumetric design. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, when I come to you, I'm speaking, you know, from experience where I, I worked on this back at Asphalt Institute back in the 1990s during the uh, thing they call the SHARP program. So I'm bringing the inside of the old, but I also want to bring the new into it and explain where we're going. And that's where uh, we, we talk about balanced mixes out on the end and how all this fits. There, there's same things that are just um, confusing to some folks. And again, uh, I like to start with the basics. So uh, while we all are in this pandemic together, we can use this time to educate and sharpen our axes a bit to, uh, uh, to get better at what we do. I'm gonna bring this next slide up. And what I want you to do is, is I need you to memorize every one of those, not really. Uh, what I would like for you to do is um, uh, just screenshot that if you want to, or use your, use your phone there and take a picture of that. Uh, that is about every definition uh, that we tend to throw around a lot in the, in the terms of mixed design. So if you hear us talking about in design or, or absorbed asphalt or VMA or VFA, uh, these are these uh, definitions that we throw around an awful lot. <clears throat> so with that, let's, uh, let's get in here and begin uh, talking a little bit about the asphalt binder. The best place to start is always with a, with a definition and that's exactly what I'm gonna do today. And uh, no surprise, <clears throat> it is a dark brown to black cement-like residue, but it is not cement, to keep that in mind, but cement-like residue obtained from distillation of crude oils. It is not coming from, uh, we do not call it tar. It is not coming from the coal refining process, but coming from crude oil. At, at bottom line, it's, the, it's a glue, and that's why we call it a binder that holds the aggregates together and also waterproofs uh, the pavement. Uh, two types of asphalt. <clears throat> One uh, is the natural occurring, and then the two is what we use from the refining or the petroleum asphalts. Uh, you, you can see over there on the on the right of the screen uh, from the island of Trinidad. There's some pictures I pulled up there, and then the and then the lower right hand corner. I actually have a <clears throat> a picture of uh, one of the companies I used to work for with the uh, with work for Coke Industry back in the day, and this is their Flint Hills uh, refinery, uh, Flint Hills refinery at Pine Bend. Minnesota. And so uh, you get an idea of, of where the asphalt comes from. Everything that we're using in the U.S. comes from petroleum-based asphalt. And matter of fact, we used to get uh, asphalt that would come from Venezuela and other places. Uh, mostly today, that is that has changed. We're, we're getting our asphalt either from Gulf Southeast, uh, it's coming from California um, or uh, Southwest sources, or we'll pull it out of uh, Canadian and, and Alaska areas. And every one of those provides a different asphalt. Well, why is that? Uh, very high level, very high level uh, overview here, but I can take a, 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 a crude oil barrel, barrel. Now keep in mind, crude oil barrels are not 55 gallon drums. They're 43 um, uh, gallons. I think I got that right anyway, without doing the quick math on that. Uh, when, you, when you break that down, and you begin to look at it, you realize that everything is driven by the gasoline or the fuel industry. <clears throat> of course, you get your petrochemicals. Let's look on the right-hand side. So what all comes off this? Everything from uh, your petrochemicals, such as aramids, um, naphthas, gasoline comes off the top. Different refining points, when you dump this crude oil and you heat it and throw it into the tower, uh, depending upon the, the different uh, the different condensing points, you're gonna get these different products off, the kerosenes, the gas oils, the lubricants, um, fuel oil. Now, if you notice on the bottom in, in this graphic that I had uh, used here from uh, Penn State, they actually, they say asphalt road tar. We do not use the word tar. Uh, it, is, it is asphalt or in Europe, we, uh, it's often called bitumen. And that's what's coming out of the bottom. What comes out of the bottom though is highly dependent upon that barrel on the left. And the heavier crudes produce more asphalt. The lighter, sweet crudes uh, will produce less asphalt, but more gasoline. <clears throat> Let's look a little bit more into that. So again, bitumen up in there, that you see that term bitumen used, which is asphalt. Uh, you, you take a look and you can understand um, what you call sweet versus, um, uh, sweet versus sour or light versus heavy, whatever what you wanna call it. From the Venezuelan heavy asphalt, or sour crude to the Nigerian light crude. And again, this is a, uh, this is just a, a broader example of what you can, uh, what you can get out of the, of the barrel. 
concerning asphalt. So I'm not going to be able to get much out of the Nigerian product at all, uh, but it's going to be awesome for gasoline. Well, that really dictates a lot of, of what the quality and, and, and keep in mind, asphalt at the, at the best, it is a waste product from the refining process. And so we talk a lot about recycling, but I'm very proud to say that, that, that we're building roads out of, of even recycled product from the refining process. And, uh, and, and that's a, that shows you that we use every ounce that's in that, uh, in that barrel. <clears throat> Historical grading systems, and you're seeing that right. Uh, people did use a chewing method. I'm glad that uh, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad I'm I'm in the um, <clears throat> in the 21st century today, and I'm not back there chewing it. But then it quickly moved to uh, penetration uh, grading, and you still see penetration grading throughout the world when they talk about 85, 100 pin asphalt. Uh, we Asphalt Institute uh, was real big in moving us to viscosity grading. Viscosity is simply as it was what you would with a motor oil. <clears throat> but in today's world, um, we, we, the only time we talk about viscosity is for construction. We, uh, the absolute viscosity that you're seeing here on the left was actually used when we were putting out things such as AC20, where 20 was representative of the, of the uh, 2000 viscosity, or an AC30 was representative of a, a 3000 viscosity. So before SuperPave, <clears throat> Um, we had viscous measures only. Now, viscosity was wonderful, and so was penetration, because it, and, and they're still good tests, but it, and it got us where we were today. But I remember very vividly when I was working for the cabinet in Kentucky, as we were switching from, uh, from this over to SuperPave, and that was one of my jobs was to move us from, from viscosity grading to SuperPave. The one issue we had was we did not have any low temperature properties that were being measured. Now we were trying to do some things with colder temperature penetration uh, or ductility, but there was just not much that we could do there. And it was important to be able to understand not only the high temperature part of the asphalt, but also the, the low temperature. Long-term aging was not really considered. There was some work being done in California, but it was just being done at that point in time as, as more research efforts. And then it began to become mainline, of course, with SuperPave. Asphalt binder, uh, interesting product in that it is, uh, as you as you have it cooled, it is a semi-solid. Uh, I tend to compare it to like a silly putty in a way, um, it, it's, and uh, in how it reacts, but silly putty doesn't react with temperature and asphalt does. It is a liquid. So if I turn it on its side over a period of days, it would pour out unless I heat it. And if I heat it up to 300 degrees or so, it will pour uh, just like water or almost like water. So <clears throat> the definition is that it's a thermoplastic material that softens as it's uh, heated and hardens when it's cooled. So I got to thinking about how that works. And I really realized that uh, early on that <laughs> asphalt is actually doing the opposite of what we need. It's uh, soft in the summer and stiff in the winter. And we really need it to be stiff in the summer and soft in the winter. So just something that we have to deal with as engineers. So today, what we've done is we've come up with a better mousetrap or a better way to, to grade the asphalt. And what we do <clears throat> is we use a, a grading system today based on climate. And we call this a performance grading system. And, and uh, there's, there's plenty of webinars out there on how this works, and that's not what today is. This is just, again, to give a very high-level overview um, uh, of, of, of what these terms are. So the PG stands for performance grading. The, the 58 is actually, uh, we'd say it's a seven-day max payment temperature. Actually, the new version of that is it's more of a, um, <clears throat> we still consider it an average payment temperature, but it's really more of a damage factor the way we, we use it today. And then the low end is actually a minus 22. So that's not a dash, that's a minus 22. And that's all in degrees Celsius. So I would end up saying that this is a PG 58 Celsius and it will perform down to a minus 22 Celsius. Now, when we put a recycle material in, we know that's not the case, but <clears throat> this is just on the, the asphalt itself. There's one intermediate grade in there that we'll talk about here in just a moment that, that there's another temperature that we often, often forget. Over there on the right is showing you how we actually measure that, and it's done between two plates, where those plates are, are to really, really represent uh, aggregates or stone, 
and that as you begin to oscillate, we understand how that thin film of asphalt acts between those plates. I'm bringing up a, um, a, a, a graphic here, and this is software that I like to use. It's called LTPP Bind, uh, Long-Term Pavement Performance uh, Binder Software. And, and this is one, and you look at it, wow, that's the you know, last time it was updated in 2005. Uh, it's still very valid. And you're looking at over 7,900 weather stations and every one of those little gray points in the U.S. is a, is a weather station. And actually, we have those around a lot of the airports uh, where you see those in Alaska and Hawaii. And in this software, I can begin to look at 98% 98, 98 reliable temperatures, keeping in mind that, that I'm not looking at just surface temperature. I'm actually looking at um, into the pavement because surface temperature is, is not representative of what the pavement depth is. So I can actually go into the pavement and, and look at what these temperatures are. And, and also, uh, air temperature is different than pavement temperature, as we know that, that uh, air can be cooler or warmer than what the actual pavement is uh, as you get into the pavement. So what you're looking at here is our 98% reliable high temperature grade. So what this is saying is these are the recommended grades uh, to keep you uh, at normal traffic, to keep you from, from uh, having a rutting issue. And so as you see a lot of orange, and, and uh, Joe, I'm gonna ask you a question here. I don't, can they see my mouse or do I need to click a highlighter on that? No, they can see your mouse. Okay, good, 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 good. So, <clears throat> so as you see all the orange that's in, in this area here, um, this tells you that you know, where a lot of the area uses uh, 64 grade asphalt. And, and up here, you see a lot of the area where they use a 58. Now, does that mean that this area in the blue has to use a 58? Absolutely not. They could use a 64 grade and even be 99% reliable, but they could get away with using a 58. As I get into Texas, they really need to be using more of a 70. Um, I just rode with our with the Surface Tech's president, uh, Steve Santa Cruz, and we were traveling in Southern California, and we were looking at some of the areas. and uh, And Steve, you can see here uh, again very vividly at all the yellow, and that's why California uses the 70 because it works very well in, in those areas. Now, here's the kicker. As I go to this next slide, <clears throat> it begins to tell you the 98% reliable low temperature grade. Now, again, this is just database stuff here. And I'm gonna explain that to you here in just a moment. So in the area that I'm sitting in here in Kentucky, I'm in a transition climate between a 22 and a 28. I go into Indiana area and I may go up to a, a down to a 28 grade or down into Tennessee and I go down to a minus 22 grade. As I go into the north, uh, I need to uh, go into a much softer grade asphalt. Uh, that the asphalt is gonna to have to be more reliable for those colder temperatures. But if I go into the south, you can see I can get away with a minus 16 or minus 10. <clears throat> well, what happens is, is if out of the Gulf Southeast, if I'm getting a 64 minus 22 asphalt, and if I have a good minus 22 asphalt, why in the world would I wanna ever try to put down a lower quality in here if I have this available? So naturally these guys down in here end up with a much better asphalt than, than what's required. And that helps them on their, on their pavement performance. In comparison, to California, we talked about differences between sweet and heavy crudes. In California, some of the best asphalt they can get may be a 70 minus 10, and then they have to modify from there. And so uh, with that, um, you're, you're, you're dealt with the local materials that you have, and then we try to build highways out of them. These maps are really useful to help us understand, again, potential performance. Again, just a quick overview of the testing and how we get there. Uh, when we look at the minus temperatures, when we talk about a minus 22 or minus 28, we are using this test here where we simply load an asphalt beam, a liquid beam, and, and we can measure how much it will comply or bend under a load. When we look at the high temperature, we're using this test here of the plate. Now, the viscosity I mentioned earlier for construction, but one test that we don't mention much is this intermediate temperature. Here I have it at 25 degrees. So some people say, well, why is it a, a 7622 may have more of a propensity to crack than a 6422? It really relies on this guy right here. That intermediate temperature for a 64 binder may be 23 degrees. For a 76 binder, that will jump up to 32 degrees. So 
little things that we tend to forget about. But when I look at that graded binder, I don't just look at a 76 minus 22. It may actually be a 76 comma 32 minus 22. So again, just pieces that we that we tend to talk in cocktail knowledge versus the deeper engineering uh, design. <clears throat> um, traffic has a big effect on what we do. It's important for us to um, to adjust our grades. And we used to use a thing called grade bumping, where we would say, well, I'm going to have more traffic, so I want to raise my high number from a 64 degree up to 70. Well, what actually happens is my pavement temperature didn't increase, but I do need a stiffer asphalt. So how do I do that? So they came up with a new specification you see here called multiple stress creep recovery. Say that three times really fast. And, and, they, and the abbreviation, it, it sounds very violent, but uh, it's, the, it's the abbreviation we came up with, or the acronym, we call it MASKER. And, and a lot of that was, was done by a guy named John D'Angelo and Asphalt Institute and, and different folks uh, were working to validate that. Uh, but it is a, it is a, it's a better way for us to understand uh, what we call grade bumping and adjusting, adjusting the performance grade uh, for that uh, from a 64 to a 70. And today they would call that instead of a 64, instead of a 70, they may call this 64 uh, E or 64 V meaning for extreme or very heavy loads that would end up moving us in this direction. Um, and over here, again, we just talk about grade bumping if you're using traditional model and, and why we would tend to move up and use a stiffer asphalt with higher traffic. The more traffic, the more resistant we have to have to that movement. Of course, every state's different, so I do want to refer you to Asphalt Institute's site. Uh, they are a great keeper of uh, specification database. I saw where uh, Wes Cooper had signed up for this, and, and uh, if Wes is on, he's actually a guy that uh, helps take care of this at Asphalt Institute. Wes, if you're on, thank you for joining us today, and thank you for keeping this up. Uh, the U.S. really relies on this very heavily, but this is a great uh, place you can go to to see the uh, this different specifications, and I promise you about every state's different, again, because of the local materials or climates or, or things that you have that's different in every state. After we uh, certify that asphalt, uh, it's, it's, it's either stored in tanks or we'll, we'll blend it. Uh, that's actually a picture I took the other day from Shelbyville Asphalt Terminal. Um, those tanks uh, can be million gallons or larger. But then, you know, how do we get it to a hot mix plant? And, and what we do there, uh, and I've got a misspelling, it's not a, it's not a pant, it's actually a plant. Uh, how do we get it there is... Um, is, is we use these asphalt uh, uh, tanker trucks that you see down here on the left. And, and we'll support that and uh, we will transport that and then pump that out into a contractor's tank. Joe, go right ahead. If you, I'm gonna take a little uh, breather break here. And again, Joe, thank you all for hosting today. And uh, if you'd go ahead with that poll question. Thanks, Phil. Give him a, a minute break here. So second poll question of the day, um, we get asked this question a lot, and that is, you know, why has fiber reinforcement in concrete been around for 20 plus years, but really not so much with asphalt pavements? So go ahead and start voting if you would, and let's see how this turns out. We'll give it about uh, 30 seconds here. Well, while we're waiting, uh, there was question here I wanted to get to, if I could. Well, that's not what I want. Oh, uh, the, I, you're talking about the question, Joe, that says, if we're having trouble logging in, can we watch the video later? No, 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 the, the one up above uh, about the contaminants in the, in the oil. With several up. I'm not sure that. Yeah, and, and we didn't we didn't actually uh, address that one. If you're talking about particulates, uh, there's a solubility test that that I did not even address on the on the slide. But absolutely, there's different tests that we use where you will dissolve the asphalt over a uh, fine mesh screen, and you're measuring for particulates, um, whether it could be uh, organics, you know, wood chips. Um, 
uh, chunks of metal or whatever it may be, we want to make sure that we don't have any particulates in that because it would also destroy the, the pumps. Uh, but yeah, there are there there's absolutely there's tests out there that we have to run. The moment that you don't run those is when you can end up with with the issues. Uh, the other wanna, question was: Can yeah. oils that are contaminated with hydrogen sulfide be utilized for binder? Oh, <clears throat> great question! And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna dodge that one just a bit by saying that's gonna be more of a local decision. Um, and I would I would really refer you to uh, Asphalt Institute or Napa for that. Um, those type of asphalts, again, you get into environmental concerns, and it really depends on the on the agency and depends on the user. I'm going to share the answers to the questions here um, or the responses. 71% um, of you got it right. It was actually all of the above. Uh, so uh, the products that uh, Surface Tech has developed. Uh, are answering all four of those bullets and moving the technology forward as far as using hair and uh, fiber and asphalt reinforcement. Thanks for taking uh, that poll question. And now, Phil, I'm going to send it back to you. Okay, Joe. Uh, so we're going to change uh, change gears now, and we're going to go with just a really high level introduction into aggregates. Um, Aggregates, as you see here, is, is any type of rock, granular material, mineral aggregate. As I go into um, West Kansas, I lived in Kansas for a while, and, and out there, you know, the aggregate, uh, the, what you call soil and aggregate becomes really, there's a, there's a gray line between those two. And, and uh, some people have, have easier to get deposits than others. The picture on the left that you see is actually uh, the a quarry, Vulcan quarry out in Irwindale and Irwindale, California. And that's, uh, you begin looking at that and uh, the issues they have out there is, is every quarry doesn't, is not set up the same. Sometimes in, like in Kentucky, we have 32 underground quarries. Uh, out in California where they're at, uh, those, their quarry gets flooded depending upon, uh, depending upon the reservoir that has to be filled in uh, uh, in in uh, in California, so they get a notice, about 24-hour notice, to to get out of the quarry before they're uh, before it's flooded, and uh, and they have to work around those situations. So uh, that's a very large quarry, as you can see there. But anyway, uh, why do we get different materials? Uh, every material is different, and 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 that's because that we're we could be dealing from sedimentary type of materials that's glued together as sediments, or we could be dealing with, with more igneous materials that could be cooled on the inside of a volcano versus uh, like on the outside of a volcano. The more porous stone versus granites that are, that are, that are more what we call intrinsic materials versus, um, um, versus those materials that are cooled on the, on the outside or exterior of the volcano. <clears throat> Aggregate makes up about 93 to 96 by what percent weight? or 84 to 90% by volume of an asphalt pavement mixture. So it really becomes the load bearing component within the pavement mixture. Now, while this makes a lot of sense, one thing that we didn't realize was, was about uh, how the roundness was really affecting and the shape of the aggregate really affected what we were doing. Uh, quarried, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, quarried or mined aggregates uh, have to be processed before use. The, the picture there on the left is one of the larger quarries in the United States. That's Grand Rivers Quarry. And that's actually here in uh, in Kentucky on land between the lakes over in West Kentucky. Been mined for years and years. And that is a, a limestone quarry. But every ledge, and even within the ledges that you see, uh, gives you different, uh, you can get different products out of that. We like to joke and say the stuff that Kentucky doesn't want, we reject and send down to Tennessee. If I got any good Tennessee folks on the on the on the phone, I apologize because I'll generally pick on you during sports uh, season, and, and that has been banned right now. So, um, when when I look at uh, aggregates in construction again, I get so many different variables, and not only from the quarry, but if I look over to the right, uh, if I look at the right of the picture and um, that's the processing side. So from my, and we're not getting into this today, but from the crushers, uh, from the cone crushers to impact crushers, to the age of my crushers, um, to my screening decks, all of that processing can make an aggregate. They can all be the same size, but they can have a very different shape 
which makes them pack very differently. As compared to sand and gravel deposits that are natural and, 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 um, and the smoother rounded particles versus a mined uh, versus one that's, that's blasted or quarried. Now, if I'm in Arizona or places and I don't have a lot of these quarried materials, I can, I can take my, uh, I can take these type of materials here and crush them and cause them to be more angular. So again, it's all in, it's all not just in the mining, but in the processing side. Now we come to recycled asphalt pavement and shingles. Uh, as you see on the left, wrap is, is common in most mixed designs today. And I'm gonna bring up a slide here in just a moment and show you um, some graphics on, on how the use is today. Um, we're, we're obtaining the wrap from job sites, as you see there. And the most important thing about wrap, it is absolutely wonderful when used responsibly. You gotta understand, not all, all asphalt is released from the aggregate. So assuming that 100% asphalt is coming off that rock is a mistake. Uh, a lot of studies have shown it's probably closer to about 80%. And again, it's gonna be different on your wrap. So just don't, don't assume 100% comes off, just pick something slightly under that. And that way you will not under asphalt your mixture. It's important that our mixture not only looks good on paper, but it's representative of that when we build it in the field too. A design is just a design, but what really matters is the construction process or, or the construction product. It's also important on the wrap that we adjust it for the uh, stiffer asphalt grade and that we properly handle and measure and quantify that wrap material in the design and also in production. When I look over at RAS, that's a very different material. So instead of having four to 5% asphalt in it, it could have 20% to 30% asphalt but it's extremely stiff asphalt. Matter of fact, it's so stiff, uh, we do not like to use uh, roofing asphalt in, 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 in our main blends. But however, we tear, come here and we take a roofing product and we put it right back in. Well, why do we do that? Well, it's good for the environment, but also a, a little bit doesn't hurt. Caution though, when using too much. Uh, too much can quickly uh, increase cracking in a highway. Again, uh, when we use these products, we have to adjust for them. And then we're going to be fine if we just put these wrap and ras in there without adjusting the binder grade, without adjusting asphalt content. That's where we get into into trouble. Napa or the National Asphalt Paving Association came up with this graphic and a very good graphic to explain to you. And I'll leave it up here in case you want to do a quick screenshot of that. But but uh, over time, how wrap has been used. And I'm just using an example here. If I'm looking at Colorado, and that's this that's the state for those that don't know about right in here in the, uh, in the, in the uh, west to Midwest United States, they've gone from about 21 to 20, 24% and pretty consistent through the years. However, if I look at Kentucky, we ramped up from about 14% recycled asphalt pavement or wrap to 15. We were up 13, then we jumped way up into about 24%. And now we're back at 16%. Why is that? Because the, the wrap was highly questioned in Kentucky. And again, um, I love wrap. We just have to use it responsibly. And once we use responsibly, we, we're doing fine. Matter of fact, I just got through working on a blend a couple of weeks ago where we moved, we were looking at using some innovative materials and, and actually using the aramid fiber and uh, able, to, able to add uh, more wrap material and moving it from a 20% wrap to 36%. And uh, so far, so good. It actually looks like potentially it's going to outperform in rutting and in cracking. Uh, quite a bit in cracking. So I'm excited to see those type of products go down. But again, we need to vet that or test that in the laboratory before we ever take it to the field. <clears throat> Basic tests that we use on aggregate, again, aggregate comes all shapes and forms. We're gonna look at angularity, shape, durability, um, where we'll tumble them and, and measure the breakdown. It's important for us to know the gravity of the material. Why do we have to know the gravity? Because we, we're gonna get into that volume and uh, weight relationship here in just a bit and gravity helps us to do that. And then we gotta look at the size. Two methods, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the size. Two methods of performing that is we look at what we call a dry sieve analysis or a wet. It's really important that we use a wet method uh, to understand dry is handy when you're in the field doing quick um, a quick analysis, but the wet is really what's going to help us understand how much dust. And I and and we say the devil's in the details. Well, in this case, the devil's in the in, in the dust. Uh, the dust can act like 
a binder as far, as far as a liquid and filling up your voids, it's important for us to understand how much dust is in the mixture. And typically report, I said three, I actually had deleted one off of there, um, is percent passing, percent retained, or the third one is percent passing and, and retained. But typically today we, we look more at percent passing. So let's take a look at what that rack of sieves would look like. And thank you to our folks there at Pavement Interactive for, for some good pictures. <clears throat> We typically look at the coarse portion of our, um, our sieves from the number four or 4.75 sieve up. Now, what is, what is all these numbers? Well, the, the metric system's easy. It's just the size in, in millimeters or in microns, a thousandths of a millimeter. Whereas I look at in the imperial or English units over here, I actually have inches of the opening, if three quarter, half inch and three eighths. And these are actually, you have to validate these and check your sieves because they'll wear out over time. But as I get into the numbers, that's actually four openings in one inch, eight openings in an inch, 16, and you get the idea right down to 200 openings into one inch. Now, what I do is I can plot that on this, on this chart. We call this, uh, we, we actually erase it to a 45 power. Without getting into too much detail, the reason we do that is it gives us this max density line. And if I were to design a gradation that, that is a certain percent passing and, and I align it to where it fits, every, fits that line very well, then there is absolutely no room theoretically for anything else in that mixture because I have proportion that mixture or proportion those aggregates to where every little spot in void is full. So they came up with these gradation lines. We're going to look at this where in control points, trying to stay out of an old restricted zone that they used to call it, which has now been removed. Um, and I use all of that uh, to help encourage what I call a strong stone skeleton. So let's look at that. Used to, we would have mixtures that would go way over or way under. And now we tend to do this thing where we make this S shape. And a lot of agencies were doing that anyway. And then SuperPave confirmed that. But that helps us to gap grade. We what we call gap grade it because we use some up here and then we go below. And what we do is we end up pulling out a lot of the middle material. So we have a heavy uh, coarse size and, and then, and then um, a decent amount to fine. And we pull out the dust, but we also pull out a lot of middle material. And, and we do that to gap grade or depending on my aggregate location and, and my crushing operation, I may end up that it's easier to make a fine mixture. For me, I wish we could make every mixture a fine mixture. They're easier to work with, uh, less segregation issues, but they do require more asphalt. Well, what does that also mean? They're also more durable. Uh, matter of fact, that's why you see the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, um, this is their go-to mixture is, is over the is what I call over the maximum density line. Now, let me give you another picture. This is just to show you that that maximum density line changes with your maximum aggregate size. So keep in mind, this graphic we looked at here, this line will change as we change our aggregate size. Now, I wanna give you a bigger picture um, just to have a little fun here. There's a lot of lines. Why do I show you that? Well, if I go, one day I just said, I just wanna plot everything that we've got and see what it looks like. And if I look at my sand inner layers, uh, that's this line that goes way up at the top. If I look at my open graded friction courses, you can begin to see that red line and how gapped and how different that red line is that is an open mixture that's porous as compared to something that's way up here. Whoops, let me back up. That's way up here that will not let water pass through. And then you see our super paved mixtures um, are in between. Um, and an SMA, uh, what's the difference between an SMA and an OGFC? Well, they, those lines track almost on top of each other, except when you get into this bottom portion and the SMA plugs up the holes, whereas the open graded friction course allows water to go through. So just having a little fun with the big picture. Joe, take it away there on the poll question. Thanks, Phil. Poll question number three. Let's go ahead and launch this. So as it relates back to one of Surface Tech's products, uh, what do you think ASEXP polymer fiber is made from? Recycled waste from carpet, aromatic polyamide, easy for me to say, uh, aramid, 
glass blend, facet wax, and then two or four. Let's let this go for a minute. Uh, Phil, I did have a question for you. Let's see here. Do other properties such as impact index of the aggregate become important when processing the HMA? Did I lose you, Phil? Go, what ahead, one more time there, Joe. It says, uh, do other properties such as an impact index of the aggregate become important while processing the HMA? Oh, uh, yeah, great, <clears throat> great question. Um, and, <clears throat> and when, you know, again, depending upon the aggregate type, and I am not a geologist, but in, um, I, uh, and actually I've got friends in that world. And, and when you begin talking, you really want to understand it, talk to the guys at the quarries and they will explain to you that, you know, such as impact crushers versus cone crushers versus the spacing and the size and the adjustments they make are so critical on these aggregates um, because you can quickly create something called flat and elongated particles versus cubicle particles. So, so you just don't go out there and take a hammer to it and crush them. Uh, there's a lot of science that goes into that. And then as far as testing that goes into that too, understanding the breakdown, um, the, the test that's used today for that are, is like the LA abrasion test or the um, uh, micro Deval test. And those, those are, those help you to understand the breakdown in the laboratory just on, 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 I guess, aggregate on aggregate contact. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Appreciate that. I'm going to close the poll uh, question and put the answers up, uh, the responses, I suppose. So uh, the correct answer is actually uh, number two and number four, 72% of you got it uh, correct. Um, and so uh, for those that, uh, you know, took the early uh, direction on Aramid is what we're talking about today uh, throughout the, in a generic term throughout the presentation, you were almost right. Um, and uh, of course, the uh, ACE product is also coated with sassafras wax. So, uh, Bill, back to you, and if you would, there you go. So just a quick uh, overview of what ACE XP polymer fiber is. It's actually a combination of two products. We call the aramid fiber the active ingredient and the sassafras wax the inactive ingredient. And you can see the dosages there that uh, make up the full product. So you're taking aramid fiber, in a bundle form, coating it with wax. It's a 50-50 mix between those two materials to uh, generate what you're seeing on the right-hand side in that picture for uh, the bundles of ACE XP polymer fiber. You know, it is a plant blended asphalt additive. The bundles are an inch and a half long. It's about 12,000 fibers in each one of those bundles. And that gives you about 10 million individual aramid fibers in each plant ton mix. Um, the wax melts at 170 degrees and becomes part of the liquid binder, or if you will, it becomes soluble in the liquid binder, releasing all of those fibers. That's why we call the Sasquatch wax uh, inactive, uh, because it's only there to weigh down the much lighter aramid fibers that would otherwise either become airborne prior to going into the asphalt plant or become part of the airstream that ends up in the bag house uh, in uh, certainly a drum plant. So the wax has a very important component, but all of the heavy lifting and all the improvement and performance comes from the aramid fiber. Go ahead, Phil, thanks. Okay, thank you, Joe. <clears throat> so we're gonna switch gears again. So we, now we've talked, you know, at this point in time, we have some more folks who've joined us up, it looks like it's about 157 now. Um, we, we've talked about, and thank you, every one of you all for being with us today. Um, if you joined us late, we, we did cover, um, the basics of asphalt liquid. We've covered the basics of aggregate. We're gonna look at an overview of design. And then we're gonna begin, uh, what we'll do in the next segment uh, is, is in about, uh, about uh, 10, 15 minutes, we're gonna start putting it all together as we begin our compaction process and look at the thing we call volumetric. So let's look at overview of mixed design uh, briefly. So things that we did, uh, things, that we, things that we had uh, in, in using here was, um, in, back in the day, we used things such as a PAT method, and and it was actually uh, it was actually a useful method to where you could you could take a mixture and put it down on brown paper. And 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 I've used a lot of visuals in in my day too. 
because it's very easy to see when um, when um, you actually uh, understand the the glossiness or, or what's in the asphalt. And after a while, you can begin to look and say, well, boy, that one needs more asphalt in it. But we know that's very subjective and we need more objective tests. So we began looking at things such as Marshall Mix Design, Corps of Engineers Gyratory came on board and boy, there's a whole lesson of things that we could talk about here. Uh, Marshall Mix Design was happening um, you know, back in the time of World War II. Um, same thing with Corps of Engineers Gyratory was really important uh, for the Army to be able to land bigger planes. And that's why this Corps of Engineers Gyratory, the term gyratory was first developed here. And, uh, and of course, uh, and then we had in California, uh, we used the thing called beam compaction, which was at one time still used by uh, California and other states. Uh, you also had uh, gyratory compactors that were used by Texas, Oklahoma, and so on. Marshall is still dominant. Why is that? It's a simple, easy device, and you don't even need the mechanical piece. You can just use the hammer and uh, not even have to automate it. But 1993, we, had, we, we launched SuperPave and we used mass adoption um, around year 2000. And what we ended up looking at is we ended up looking at a, um, uh, a gyratory that was gonna be more representative. We'll talk about that here in a moment. So what is an asphalt mix design? It, it's just a blend of aggregates by size and an, an amount of asphalt binder. And we're doing it while we analyze it by volume. When we send it out to the job site, we're doing it by weight because that's all that uh, they can measure. And, and the design is really based upon optimizing, well, again, what we call the volumetric properties or the volumes of air and the volume of asphalt and the volume of the aggregate. One uh, really good reference that I wanna bring up here is the, um, is the Asphalt Institute Mixed Design Manual. And, and that, um, uh, that is called their MS2. That's a, their seventh edition, really well-written book. And it's one that uh, pretty much um, uh, the world over is a, it's a, it's a common reference for so many folks to use. So again, looking at mixed design, it, it's definitely a balancing act. A good friend of mine um, uh, had, had talked about this many times in the graphic, and he's used this before, Dave Johnson's his name at Asphalt Institute. And he, um, he talks about, you know, how important it is. And and I said, yeah, you know, this, this really does turn into a, a real balancing act from good strength and stability to, uh, to needing it durable, from having no rutting, but we don't want cracking. Well, we don't want shoving, but we also don't want raveling or the, the, the particles ravel away. And, and you get that. Well, what's the public want? The public just wants something that's a nice, smooth, quiet ride. Easy enough. So how do we do this? We do it through material selection and volumetric design. And that's our starting point that we're talking about now. Again, we need a pavement that's going to be st stable. It's not going to rut and shove. It's going to be crack resistant. It's going to be resistant to if I bend it too many times and fatigue that it won't crack. It's going to be good low temperature uh, resistance. It's going to have water. I don't want water to go through to my base where it weakens my soil base. But I need it to be easy to place. I need it to be compactable. We often look at that. One of the number one complaints of contractors, our mixers are too harsh to compact. And if we can't get mixers to compact, that is a number one durability issue. And what's critical for safety, we better have good aggregate in it so that when you hit your brakes on a wet pavement, you don't go skidding off the roadway. So in the material selection uh, process, we, um, we, we're gonna look at two things here. Uh, now we're gonna begin to pull this together. I wanna look at, the skeleton or the bones of the asphalt mixture, which is my aggregate. And again, we've already talked about um, the, 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 the weights and, and the percentages there uh, that you see on the left. On the right, I've also got to understand how much binder or how much liquid to put in. I keep in mind my recycled asphalt pavement or in my wrap is also an aggregate, but it's also a binder. We're not going to go into details how to design with that today, but realize that it plays in both worlds. Why do we go and try to compact this stuff in the laboratory? Why can't we just sort of eyeball it, take it to the field? Well, we have to, number one, understand the potential density that we can get in the field, but we also have to accommodate that there's gonna be future traffic that's gonna hit this thing. And it will, what I call post-compact, just a little, um, 
if it's designed right, it will post compact with, with after it has had a load put on it. And then what I end up with is, is I'm trying to simulate all of that in a laboratory sample. So which compactor then best simulates compaction? Well, the best way to do it is you go right out to the, you go out the field and you go get you a, a 10 by 10 uh, area and you run a paver over it and run a little roller over it. And that's great, but that is just not portable and it's just not practical. So there was a study done called the AMOS study that was done in the late eighties. And they went and looked at different compactors and they found out Marshall hammer was actually one of the worst, but it was also very practical. One of the best uh, that they found out was again, the rolling wheel compactor that we talked about where I go and do the, the, the just small scale simulation. Uh, Marshall was so far down on the list, they realized we had to have something better. So they, they started looking at these gyratories and they found out the gyratory worked really well. And, um, and keep in mind, the French had used a gyratory that they had uh, developed from the Corps of Engineers gyratory that I mentioned early on. So what did we do? Uh, we, we looked at the technology and uh, we took it and we uh, wanted to make it better and make it uh, more reliable. And that's what we focused on. So we came up with the super pave uh, gyratory compactor. And that's what I worked on for uh, right out of uh, right in while I was still in college and doing a lot of that work in, in trying to correlate that back to field compaction. What's out there today? Well, I sure didn't have these options 30 years ago um, or, or 25 years ago. Um, today, you have all of these wonderful options from a pine to, to the Troxler controls, uh, the, the Brovald and, and a Cooper Cox device. Uh, the, the two key devices that we really started off with in the US were the two on the left. And that's what most people I think are familiar with is when you look at a pine and Troxler. And they actually uh, split these early on and and half the states got a pine and half the states in the US got a Troxler. And uh, when they when they originally uh, were doing all these, and these are these are just workhorse devices and um, that, that that's made to impart a lot of energy in a small space. Back to volumetric analysis. What I'm doing is I am compacting this in the laboratory again. And the reason I do that is I'm trying to understand and calculate the relative masses and the volumes occupied by the aggregate and the asphalt binder and air voids. And keeping in mind, some of my, um, some of my binder, my asphalt is absorbed into that aggregate. So I'm gonna give you a few terms. This is one you may wanna take a quick picture of with your phone again, but um, uh, air voids, we're gonna call that VA or some people are calling it PA because it's really a percent. Uh, voids in the mineral aggregate is VMA, bulk specific gravities, that's the G's. Anytime you see a G, that's a bulk specific gravity. When I say VFA, that's a percentage of this VMA. Now I'm getting confused myself. Uh, there's a lot of terms, guys. Uh, one that I don't want you to forget is what we call dust proportion or dust asphalt ratio. We'll talk about how those work. Again, this is just the overview piece. When I look at specific gravities, um, there's a lot of terminology. So we have the S means stone. Uh, it should have been A, right? Well, we use an A down here. So I had to use stone up here. So um, S, um, S picks up for the stone. M is for the mixture, B the binder, and you get the idea. So now I can come over here and say, so a bulk specific gravity would be a G SB for the stone and for the bulk or a GMB would be for my mixture or a bulk. Gives you an idea of what that is. Again, specific gravity, uh, just uh, back to what my kids were always reminding me of back when they were in fifth grade. Um, it's um, mass over an equivalent volume and, and, and that's all defined by water. Again, just a high level overview. Uh, you can see a picture on the left of an asphalt mixture with air voids. Now I'm gonna take the asphalt out and that space between all the rocks is what I call VMA. So let's not confuse that. VMA sometimes can be this really high level term that we get, that we, we think is a, a something that's in a magic box. It's not. VMA, avoids the mineral aggregate, is just the space between my rocks for asphalt and for air. And then I guess one other term I'll use and I'll introduce is called VFA is what percent of that space did I fill up with my asphalt? 
we talk about air voids, we talk about rutting, uh, three to four percent, what I want you to realize from this, three to four percent is just a target that was empirically derived um, to allow for thermal expansion. We know we don't want to go up higher than, really higher than four uh, percent. Caution was put to go below three to four. That was when we used a lot of rounded sands. In today's world, I have designed things right down to eight tenths air voids, and, but I do a lot of testing in the laboratory to make sure that I'm I'm not overdoing it. Um, I have no issues with with designing down with lower air voids as long as we can get the control and know the know what we're going into with the with the lab. I'm going to show you quickly here the the relationship. So as I increase asphalt binder in a mixture, you decrease the air voids. And if you notice, I end up with like a little curve usually in here, whereas it approaches the bottom that it ends up uh, beginning to, to fill that space to where I can't fill it anymore. Now, let's look and see what happens when I now look at what I call uh, VMA. Again, VMA is the volume of those voids that I can now fill with asphalt and air. And so um, what I'm gonna do here is I am now going to um, fill those voids with asphalt. So let's take a look and see what happens. So now I'm increasing my asphalt content and I have now filled my void space. Remember I said we had about 80, uh, nine, 84 to 90% void space. Well, that, um, or, or sorry, that's filled with rock. And then the remainder of that, that, that inverse proportion of that, or what I call my VMA, the, the, the 10 to 16%, now I can begin to fill with asphalt. And that's what we're doing here. Now, what happens? I always say it's important to design over here. What happens? Can I get VMA when I when I continue to add asphalt? Yes, I can, but something very bad happens. I push my rocks apart because now my aggregate, my aggregate is um, is being pushed away uh, by my asphalt. Joe, take it away there. Thanks, Phil. Okay, poll question number four. Uh, what is Aramid? Go ahead and take some time and, and answer that. And uh, Phil, I'm going to bring up a, a poll question for everybody that was asked. Um, and that is uh, with using our Sassabit wax as a, uh, a coating mechanism, a delivery device for the lightweight Aramid. Does it have any effect like warm mix, uh, you know, as using Sassabit as a warm mix additive? Um, it, we get this question a lot. And for those that aren't necessarily familiar, certainly Sassabit wax was one of the first warm mix additives uh, in the country used or really around the world. Um, it has uh, gone to other types of uh, technologies today and not used as much. Um, but uh, typically when it was used, it was used in, I believe, two to four percent of the liquid weight, correct? Uh, I believe that's correct, right, uh, Phil? And, you know, so if you look at the weight, we're not using nearly enough uh, sassafras wax to, to make a, a difference. Uh, however, that technology, uh, in that it does, in fact, uh, work well with liquid asphalt is one of the reasons why we chose sassabit wax as opposed to any other wax. So uh, it uh, being dissolved uh, or, uh, you know, completely in a liquid binder is a big deal. So with that, let's see. Uh, everybody has voted. Let's share. So, uh, just about everybody got that one right. It is a high strength synthetic engineered fiber. That's important to know. It's not a recycled product. It's not uh, any other plastics that you can think of that have been repurposed. Uh, it is a dry polymer um, by definition. So as we think about what Phil has talked about with polymer grading, polymer bumping, uh, improving things through polymer modification on the binder side, you get very similar results when you use Aramid. Uh, typically, you will get a bump and grade on the top and on the bottom. So you're looking at a 6422. Uh, it would be when you add one dose of aramid fiber or ASEX P polymer fiber in there, and you would end up with a 7028. So it's uh, really uh, good for that and, and gives some explanation of just how the product's working in asphalt. 
Uh, by weight, it is five times stronger than steel. So congratulations to you 80 percenters. You are brilliant. So Phil, back to you. Thank you, Joe. I um, appreciate it. Hopefully everybody, if you need to, at this point, we are, uh, we're, we're a little over halfway through. Uh, get up, take a little bit of a stretch there, and just don't don't leave me. Uh, take a little bit of a break. Um, do some exercises at your desk, and I'm just going to keep going right on. And um, just want to thank again everybody who is who is staying with us, and and, um, and and appreciate you being on today. What we're going to do is we're going to look now that we've 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 gone over an overview of the liquid, of the aggregate, of the compaction, and how all that works. We're now we're just gonna simply go through and put these things together. So let's let's go back now and pick our materials. And we're gonna start here, and then we're gonna move through our blend and optimum asphalt, and then we're gonna end up testing. So let's, uh, let's, let's start with our material selection. Remember that I brought up earlier on, it's important for us, and over here on the left, I'd have some references to Asphalt Institute's uh, manual series, which I think are, again, a really good reference book. Um, what we're going to do is, is now we're going to choose our asphalt grade, whatever it may be for your region. After we've done that, uh, we're going to go on and, and get our aggregate ready. But before we can do that, it's really important for proper sampling. Why do I say that? Uh, all too many times we end up getting garbage into the laboratory because somebody has gone out and sampled like you're seeing right here from a stockpile. Keep in mind at a stockpile, when I'm when I'm dumping my aggregate into the top of it, the big stuff rolls to the bottom or on the sides where all the fine stuff's in the middle. So often what you the, what the proper sampling is, is you're actually supposed to go out and this is a last resort and you just don't do it. You, you go out and take a loader and build a miniature stockpile and you go and you take multiple samples out of that. Um, once you get that into the laboratory, then, and then again, I refer you to these ASHTO, um, ASHTO sampling methods up at the top. Then we're gonna reduce the samples to size and we do all of that uh, just to obtain a representative sample because I can do a design all day long, but if I've got the wrong materials or the wrong uh, improper materials uh, that's, that's sampled incorrectly, uh, I may come up with a design that doesn't even match what, what the contractor has. So now, now, I've got, now I've got my asphalt and I've properly sampled my rock. I go in the aggregate, I'm gonna go in the laboratory I'm gonna run this, this aggregate gravity. This is a coarse aggregate gravity. I'm gonna run a fine aggregate gravity. What are aggregate gravities? Well, if water is about a 1.0, um, aggregate gravity is gonna run uh, in the, in, from the 2.6 range to 2.7 to 2.8 range, depending just on how dense that aggregate is. Uh, it can get into lighter weight materials, but those are more porous uh, and, and can absorb more asphalt. So by my mention of absorption, I'm gonna be measuring my gravities and I have a parent, I have SSD. SSD is the one we use, surface saturated dry. And then um, uh, bulk, um, or I'm sorry, I'm using the bulk gravity. SSD is typically used in concrete world, um, but, I use, uh, but I do saturate and, or dry it. And then uh, the bulk gravity is what I'm using for my gravity and my design. And then absorption is critical because about half my asphalt uh, will absorb or if i'm having um if i'm if, if i'm absorbing one percent water that would be equivalent to probably about a half percent asphalt absorption so about half asphalt compared to water will absorb because it's a it's a thicker or more viscous material as asphalt is compared to water okay i've got to look at general aggregate characteristics cleanliness texture particle shape does it like asphalt uh, could it be? Could there be limitations to where asphalt just will not stick to it? Absorption, toughness, as we talked early on. I've got to look at coarse aggregate angularity. I'm looking at fractured faces. I'm looking at these here. Are these are these materials that I could dump out on a countertop and they will pile up? Or are these materials that's so rounded when I dump them out they spread out like marbles and they just and they will not pile? So that internal angularity I can measure. Uh, internal friction and internal angularity, I can measure by what I call coarse aggregate angularity. But I can't really do that, and I do that by inspection, but I can't do that on the fine. And I'll talk about that here in a moment. So yeah, there's a method for coarse aggregate angularity. Fine aggregate angularity, I would like to do the same thing, but I'm not gonna sit there all day and separate the materials out with a spatula. 
Um, that would be awesome, but not great use of time in a microscope. So I can do this by actually pouring it into this cylinder and understand how much it fluffs up. Rounded materials <clears throat> will want to easily pack. Just like if you're walking on a beach, they'll just move out from under your feet very easily. As compared to something that is angular, uh, they will want to fluff up and, they, and those little edges sit on top of each other. Now, the very moment I disturb that sample, they'll begin to collapse. But that is what we call uncompacted voids, or it helps me an indirect way to measure what I call fine aggregate angularity. So now I've got coarse and fine aggregate angularity, really important, and those two tests are just critical for understanding how much load these mixtures can take. Can, can, can take. I can take a great asphalt binder, but put it in a rounded sand, and it's going to rut. I can take a really good aggregate blend and put it with a, a very weak asphalt binder, and it's going to rut. So it's important to get these material combinations. I've got to watch out about clay content. So I use a sand equivalent or plastic fines test to help me understand clay. Too much clay can cause can cause other issues. It causes clumping in the in the plant. It causes production issues. It also causes stripping issues and, and raveling. So, so I have tests that's built around that. Again, this is just an overview, folks. Um, another test that I have to look at is a flat and elongated test. And this was one that was very new to our industry. We had really not looked at this. And we, we realized that this, again, these type of tests came out of uh, the early work. And we realized that, that something like this, this is a proportional caliper in the right upper, right upper corner here. Um, what it does is allows me to understand flat particles or elongated particles or flat and elongated particles. I take these two particles, <clears throat> I take these particles and if I build a mixture that only have these particles in it and put it on a roadway and I throw a roller on it, all those materials will realign and they'll stack on top of each other. And now I don't have good interlock, I actually have sliding plates. And that makes for a bad mixture. So depending upon where I'm at, I have to make sure that I adjust my uh, dimensions correctly so I do not end up with too many of these flat or elongated particles. After I've figured out all the aggregates that I want, now I have to go and prepare the aggregates uh, for, for uh, putting them together in the laboratory. Um, on the uh, upper left, uh, you see my four stockpiles that I have. These are actually, this is actually at my laboratory here. These are number 11s. This is actually a, uh, a washed sand. So these two materials are the same. This one just has an extra, um, an extra step in the process where I actually wash the dust off. This is more of a waste material from the, as I like to look at it, from the uh, crushing process. And then this is my natural sand. So then I will pre-blend these materials, but I don't just end there. I actually will go and shake those down and break them into every one of these bins. And I actually have a picture of my son working, and that just reminds me that uh, to uh, that uh, <laughs> I've got I got a good boy if I can get him to go back there in the laboratory and uh, and do that work for me. And I and I appreciate him helping me out, especially during this time of the the coronavirus. Absolutely. He does remind. Yeah, he reminds me often that his beard is uh, is 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 dark and mine is gray now. And I said, well, that's because of you, son. <laughs> um, as, as many fathers can say. But now you see I have now broken my aggregates, my blended aggregates down into each one of these. And that's important because I need that level of control. Even with my wrap material that you don't see here, I don't just scoop out of my wrap. I like to break my wrap into three or four bins because all of the asphalt in the wrap is in the fine portion. So it's important to separate your, your wrap too. Joe, go ahead there with the poll question, if you would. Thank you, Phil. Uh, go ahead and launch this next one. How do you think, as we're talking about mix design, and obviously we're adding some type of volume into the mix, uh, how do you think that affects the mix design when we add ASEXP polymer fiber? And you have some selections there, no change uh, to subtle changes, increase in air voids, decrease in air voids. Do we need to add more binder content to compensate for the fiber absorption? Let's see how we're doing here. Bill, I don't have any other uh, important questions at this point. Um, you know, this is this was one of the early on questions that you had to 
uh, talk about or, or prove to yourself in the lab. Um, so as we uh, uh, turn this over, I'm going to let you speak to the to the testing you did in the lab to uh, to know the answer to this. All right. Okay, Joe. All right, so just a couple more seconds here, and we'll close this poll. <clears throat> so let's share it. Um, most everybody got it correct, and a lot of everybody, you know, over half uh, believed as uh, as you did, Phil, in the beginning that uh, there's no way if you're putting volume in, how could it not be changing uh, the mix design? Correct. So I want to share with the team what you did there in the lab uh, to validate. Well, yeah, and and um, when I first met the the guys at Surface Tech, I uh, Joe told me this very thing, and I said, Joe, you can't be right. And um, so I took it in the laboratory, and 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 so I I checked it, and we added different amounts of the uh, A6P polymer fiber, um, all the way up to Joe. I want to say, as far as this pure aramid, um, uh, six what, times six yeah. times the dosage, yeah. and it did yeah. not affect the volumetrics. How is that? Uh, even talking with um, some of my good uh, friends in the industry, uh, it it does have surface and you're coating it. Uh, the surface is so small, it doesn't seem to have any effect. And um, although it does rely on the asphalt, it, I have just not been able to see any effect in the laboratory or in the field where it changes um, the, the, uh, the air voids in the mixture. And I think that gets back into the fact, Joe, that it is using some of the asphalt uh, but one, it's improving the the property so much. One, you cannot see it on the cracking or running because you're getting such a good improvement. I think the other thing too is is uh, I think there's a there there's definitely something that's helping with the compaction where it's displacing it. It's hard to put a a, a good um, a measure on it, but but with whatever it's doing, the bottom line is there's there's no change. Yeah, you may make a great point. Once uh, once you see the the product installed at the at the plant and then uh, transport it out or, or up into the, the silo and you get a bucket full of it, uh, you can start to see those fibers in there and how they're holding everything together. Um, most contractors would report that they get, uh, you know, quicker compaction hitting that, uh, you know, that desired uh, percentage much quicker. And they think it's because, you know, the mix itself, the loose mix comes out tighter to start with. You've got some slides on that coming up, I think it's pretty interesting. So. With that, I'm going to hide it, Phil, and send it back to you. Okay, thank you, Joe. We're going to switch gears again now, and now we've we've uh, began putting these things together in the laboratory. We've got our materials. We're ready. Oh my goodness, we're ready, and and all of that just to get to here. Um, in the laboratory, you know that that process of getting those materials ready can be take up to a week just to get things dried out and shaken down and and measured and processed, and and so. Now we're ready to go and put it in, in, in the laboratory and compact it and understand uh, how to put this together. Uh, this slide here is actually from Taylor County Airport where um, this was actually an inner layer uh, uh, that was used where uh, I've done a lot of work with inner layers in the past. I used the, the A6P polymer fiber in an inner layer on an airport and, and you see that really smooth look. That is not a super paved, I just want to point that out. That's not a super paved mixture. That actually is an inner layer there and that's that really fine mix that we pointed out earlier on with the the gradation. Okay, so where are we at? Uh, we have got our materials. We're going to move now into the to the aggregate blend and asphalt binder. <clears throat> so we're going to go into the laboratory. We have about seven steps that we're going to walk through here, seven or eight steps. We're going to heat our asphalt, aggregate molds, plates, scrapers, and uh, we got it all ready. We're going to throw all that in the oven. After it's heated, <clears throat> taking um, three or four hours, and I use timers on my um, on my ovens to do that, so it's good and hot and ready when we come in in the morning. Uh, we pour our batched uh, heated aggregate into a bowl or bucket that I like to use, a bucket mixer you see there. Um, and um, that's one, I, I got that one from HMA Lab Supply. I love my bucket mixer because it just is, uh, it, it's practical in a laboratory. And I used to use the orbital, but uh, after I went to the bucket mixer, it is just the most practical uh, piece of equipment that um, that you can use. Now, that's actually a stainless steel bucket. It's not a typical bucket. You can use a regular bucket, but I like the stainless steel a lot better just because it's more durable. Now I'm gonna make a hole for the asphalt in the middle. 
I'm going to pour that asphalt in that you see there on the left. Then we begin the, um, I'm, and, and that's step number four. Step number five, I'm going to begin mixing my aggregates, usually about two minutes to be consistent. Uh, there's other manufacturers, the additives that you can put in the mixture, such as the, uh, like, like the aramid fiber, for instance. And I actually put a picture in there, Joe, of the aramid fiber that you can see hanging off there um, after the mixing process. Uh, step six, uh, I'm going to, after mixing it, I've got to spread it evenly in a pan to make sure that it's one to two inches deep in that pan or 25 to 50 millimeters. And I got to remember uh, to scrape the bucket or the bowl, uh, no aggregate left behind in that because fines are the key to filling those air voids. And, and it's important um, to do that right. I just realized I missed, even misspelled specification, Joe. Anyway, um, it's important to adjust your pan size for your, um, for your aggregate. I'm gonna to have to get you a, a dictionary or something. I'm gonna to have to have a, a dictionary or, or something and uh, somebody to look over my shoulder on that. But the problem is, is, uh, is uh, you're after your eyes run together and you spell check the, <laughs> I think I may just be creating new words too, Joe. So um, <clears throat> Batman never had these problems, but I do. So, so uh, let's talk about mixture conditioning just for a moment. Uh, it's important back in here when I put that mixture in that pan that I spread it evenly. Why? Because I've got to allow that time for the aggregate, um, that aggregate has to be able to absorb. And as you see that one picture, that's a lot of absorption on that one aggregate. <clears throat> Two hours will let you get the minimum absorption. Uh, they tell you to stir it every 60 minutes. My recommendation is do not stir it. I found that to be a, 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 a actually causing another problem, which a lot of ovens can't recover and it's leading to under conditioning. So anyway, super pave originally required four hours and they backed it off to two for less absorptive aggregates. I, um, and that's what I do uh, is I like to use what I call the, uh, the, 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 the less than uh, two hour or less than 2% absorption, I use two hours. However, um, I'm always liking to use the four hours for other reasons. If I am trying to understand performance testing, I have to use four hours because three things are happening. One is I have absorption going on in the binder. One, I have the aging of the asphalt thin film. And again, this is some more, more absorption that you see here on this aggregate. And then the third one that we hadn't talked about is the release of the asphalt binder from the wrapper RAS. Handling that wrapper RAS, if I'm not heating it, not if I don't have my it heated properly, if I've used two, if I've used the, uh, if I've just put a big pile in there and it's still wet, uh, if I'm not mixing it long enough, all of those little things blow up big when I'm putting in more wrap and ras. 10% wrap and ras, you're not going to see it. 20%, you'll see it. 30%, oh my goodness, 40 and 50, um, you're going to get all sorts of variables. So it's important to allow that release of the asphalt binder from the wrap ras, because I promise you, these things will happen at the plant side and you've got to simulate it in the, in the lab. So when in doubt, use four hours. Absorption is absolutely critical. Then I'm going to transfer it. Step seven, step eight, uh, I'm gonna compact it here in the gyratory. So I gotta transfer it from the pan using something like a gyro loader. I like those because it, it's a way for me to measure and get a consistent amount in there. And it, and it also reduces segregation. I'm gonna load it in the mold, out of the mold and, and up pops this compacted sample. And most importantly, <laughs> um, as I learned early on in my career, um, label those samples because you try to come back to them in about 10 minutes and you'll forget what you did because you got another one coming out of the oven. Uh, typically you're spacing these about 10, 15 minutes apart. Then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna measure those gravities I talked about. And from that, I'm gonna measure all of these properties. And I throw those up there um, just to show you some of the properties we're gonna be mentioning here in a minute, whether it's voids, VMA, VFA, percent binder that's effective or percent effective binder, the dust proportion, dust asphalt ratio, the percent GMM or percent density and in initial in design and even, uh, and some states do use NMAX and, and I like NMAX because as I go to lower air voids, NMAX gives me just a, a factor of protection that I, that I don't get otherwise. <clears throat> Here you actually see um, um, a sample being prepared uh, for, um, um, for, for what I call measuring the bulk gravity, the, the mixture of bulk gravity. If I'm actually working with cores, I'll use something like a device like this, where I vacuum seal the device, and that way um, I'm 
got to be careful not to eliminate any problems where I'm watering in uh, to the exposed uh, aggregate or exposed voids in the sample. Percent air voids um, is what every, we, we use this to drive everything that we're doing. It's a big bet on this parameter. And from this, we calculate a lot of other parameters. Just be aware that when we talk about things such as VMA and we talk about percent density, these are percents based upon combinations of two or three other measures. So thus we begin to have lots of error that can, get, can be built up. So just something to, to be aware of. Finally, I try, maybe I've tried five blends here and I've, I've put together something with a lot of natural sand, a little natural sand, a lot of screenings, a little screenings, one, uh, maybe tried number 11s, or I tried to blend some number of number 11s with a, uh, with a quarter inch chip. Uh, just again, different things I've tried to do here. Um, I'll look at my, my, my percent binder uh, PB that I put in here. I'll look at my VMA understanding, you know, hey, high is good, but if I, but if I don't have to be high, I don't wanna be. Maybe if I'm dealing with a smaller aggregate mixture, uh, maybe 12 would be fine. But as you see up here, I'm dealing with a 12.5 or a half, a half inch. So my specification, I really wanna be at is closer to about a 14. Uh, this would be way too high. That's great, but I'm not gonna give it away because if I give away too much asphalt, then the issue is I'm not gonna be in business next year. Then I'm going to understand the voids, how much I filled the voids with my asphalt content. I want to look at my um, my percent GMM at in initial to make sure it's not too compactable. Actually, all of these are under 89. So every this 83 makes me really nervous here because that may be too harsh to compact. I want to look at my absorption uh, or I'm sorry, my effective asphalt, assuming that I'm probably getting some absorption. Looks like on this one, I'm probably getting somewhere about eight tenths absorption. On, on some of these six, uh, six, seven, eight tenths absorption. And then my dust proportion. Uh, for me, uh, for a durable mixture, I love to be in that one to one, two range. One six, we pushed all the way up there in fear of rutting. And when we got these mixtures so harsh, you're seeing people scale back into the one, two, one, one, four at least range. But again, we pushed up to one six. Do so not, Phil, oh, oh, go ahead, Phil, Joe. Let me, let me throw you uh, under the bus here for a minute uh, and look forward to uh, what's coming up next, and that's going to be performance-based testing or performance enhancement of those trial blends. Just looking at those numbers there, I know you know which one of those mixes will perform the best in rutting and crack. Why don't you tell everybody else? Yeah, <clears throat> well, you know, you, you look at that, and <laughs> it's typically going to be the one that probably has that highest VMA, Joe. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that's going to be the best, but I've also got a $50 mix as compared to a $46 mix. So I've got to I've got to understand the economics in that, and that's what a, a really good question. So what am I going to end up doing as a contractor? Well, I'm not incentivized to put that one down. I'm going to go exactly. to, to the next that's one. Where, down. That's where I'm going with all this as we start talking about performance-based testing. That's um, right. <clears throat> which will then encourage uh, the better mix to go down um, and get paid for this, that, and the other. So that's it's right. Not like we don't know. Now, what it takes to, from a volumetric standpoint to make it a better product is just whether or not uh, the contractor community that, uh, you know, it all bids uh, on low uh, on low dollar. And, you know, to be competitive, they got to fit in that specification of the DOT. And if that specification is wide enough, they're going to give probably the, you know, the second or third best option that they could come up with from a cost perspective to be low. That's and right. And that's, that's that's where we live today. Well, and that's where uh, the low bid system um, and even DOT folks will tell you, we, we have we live with the low bid system to try to keep the prices right. Um, the low bid system is also uh, one of the worst things to have because it takes us instead of getting these products to the it's not the low bid system, though. It's the specifications in the low bid system. So Correct. the moment, the moment the, the that we range begin, that you're allowing, the range that's that right. you're allowing in the specification. Correct. So now that I begin putting performance-based requirements in, it's going to allow me to say, don't just bid for minimum asphalt content. Maybe that I'm going to be aiming for, boy, what's the cheapest one I could probably make? It's probably this guy right up in here. Uh, maybe a 496 mixture. Um, or, or maybe my second best option to have a little room in the field is a 5.37 um, asphalt content. Maybe, maybe that's what I'm looking at, maybe one of these two mixers. When I know that this one's probably going to get me better performance, well, 
I'm going to, if I have a rutting and cracking test in place, it's going to be the, the, uh, the end all test. So again, what we just went through is we just did the design aggregate structure. Now I'm going to rinse and repeat and do that same process for selecting the optimal, optimum asphalt content. So back here, let's say if I took trial blend number uh, two for the sake of it, then I would move forward with that and change the asphalt content to understand what my volumetrics look like. So let's, let's go do that. Um, go ahead and let's do this poll question first and we'll do a trial asphalt content. We'll wrap this one up, Joe. All righty. Go ahead and launch this one, folks. So how much heat can ACE XP polymer fiber withstand before it degrades? And as we've already talked about, the sassafras wax melts at 170 degrees and becomes soluble in the liquid AC. So we're really talking about the aramid portion of the product at this point. Uh, and I'm guessing that just about everybody's going to get this one right. Um, in order for the aramid to be compatible, if you remember one of the early slides on the poll questions, that product better not, uh, you know, degrade before the heat in which it's put being put in. So asphalt typically uh, at the drum uh, plant at the wrap power is going to be anywhere from 310 to 330 degrees. We better be better than that, or we're going to be sacrificing mechanical properties uh, and not delivering the reinforcement that uh, we think we are. So, got some voting coming in. We've got some votes coming in. Let's let it go one more second. I think I've got any new questions. I got one here for you, Steve, or uh, Bill. What percentage of the RAS and RAP AC percent do you consider as effective AC percent in a mixed design? Um, um, <clears throat> yeah, I. The, the number that I use is about 80%. So, so let's say if I have 20%, make some simple math, 20% wrap that I'm using, which is common. And that 20% wrap has, let's say 5% asphalt in it. 20 times five gives me 1% asphalt that I would normally count on that very common practice. And I love getting not only the aggregate out of the wrap, but I love getting the asphalt. For me, I would not use the 1% uh, asphalt. I would use eight tenths of that or 80%. And, and what's that mean? Well, the moment I do that, it's gonna change my dust asphalt ratio and it looks different on paper. And so, um, because by assuming that that's happening, otherwise I'm just filling those voids with dust. The moment that I assume my wrap has less asphalt in it, now I will fill the voids with liquid binder. And again, that's that's some of the issues what we've why we've had issues in the past. And and again, it's going to be different for every state. There's no absolute to that. But one state may say, "Wow, I have a stiffer wrap," and maybe if maybe they're using all base wrap, so you do it for base versus versus surface. But one state may use 70%, another one may use 90%. The the point the point is we should not be using 100%. Thank you, Joe. Hey, no, no problem, Bill. In fact, you and I have debated in the past if we just would use wrap as an aggregate source and not count on it uh, contributing any oil, we'd be in a heck of a lot better position mm -hmm. using wrap today. Now, you don't get yeah, the cost savings, but yeah. from a performance standpoint, you get a better product. So yeah, you did, yeah, just don't over asphalt it. And uh, but you, right. you're exactly right, Joe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, the answer to the poll question is actually 932 degrees F uh, is the uh, where Kevlar or Aramid starts to degrade. Uh, for those uh, that aren't completely familiar with uh, the Kevlar or Aramid product, most of the fireman's gear around the world is made out of it. So it is a fire retardant uh, kind of property or, or has fire retardant properties, obviously a high heat resistance. Again, making it the perfect fiber to be used in a heated asphalt drop plant. So I'm going to give it back to you there, Bill. Thank you, Joe. Um, so at this point, um, we're going to we're going to wrap this part up here and talk about selection of asphalt content. So again, in the world that I live in today, we're still aiming for 
three to four percent air voids um, specification in Kentucky. I think they're using 3.5 today um, in their new specifications. They've lowered the gyrations and so on. Um, keeping in mind that <clears throat> that um, you know agencies are now starting to come off the four percent air voids, but we do these changes cautiously because we want to make sure that that we put something down. We don't have massive failures because when a DOT messes up, they mess up with hundreds of miles on the highway on projects has been bid. It's not that they're just going project to project. So that's why the caution exists there today to make these slower changes in industry. And even the gyrations, I mean, we've known for years that that we were high on gyrations because the original work pointed to the lower gyrations, uh, we, we, but we inflated it. We, we went up a little higher to begin with, again, adding a level of caution. And you know, years later, we find out we, we ended up with a little more cracking. Uh, cracks are a lot easier to fix than ruts. Ruts is, is a lot of replacement. Cracks, you use crack filler. So, so now um, off that soapbox and back to this, after I've got my initial design asphalt content, I go in there and I'm gonna take that gradation I talked about and I'm gonna fill it with uh, different asphalt contents. I may use, in this example, I may use 4.5, 5% asphalt, 5.5, 6, and 6.5. And the reason I do that is to build this curve. It's helpful in the field that I know how my mixture responds. And some people use four, I, 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 I use four to five, just depends on what I'm doing. And, but the point is, is now I begin to fill my mixture with, I'm holding all my aggregates consistent, but I add that asphalt and I'll begin to fill my voids, as you see here. I'm gonna do the, <clears throat> I'm gonna come in here, let's say if I'm just gonna go at 4% air voids, I'm gonna end up with something other like a 5.6 asphalt content. If I went with about three, five, uh, naturally, I'm, I'm going to be uh, moving over to probably, um, you know, five, uh, five, eight asphalt content or somewhere in there. And, and for about every 10th asphalt uh, that you add, you'll collapse your voids three to four tenths. That, um, that's, that's a pretty standard relationship. Whereas dust, it's about 1% dust to change your air voids about 1%. So let's look at what happens now on my BMA. Notice, notice on this case, I enter in and I, and I go back <clears throat> and I start at 5.6. Actually, I was off on that just a little bit. Um, I, the slide showed up wrong there a little bit, but it, uh, it slid over on me. But you get the idea. As I enter in, uh, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to end up with a 15.8% um, BMA. Well, that meets my minimum. I like that one. That, that works. What ends up happening here? Is is now I've I've locked into a certain amount of uh, uh, of asphalt and I'm seeing what my resulting BMA would be. I want to understand how this curve responds to asphalt content. Do I meet the minimum, uh, which I do, because my minimum on if I was using a 12.5, my minimum would be down here at a 14, so I'm way above it. Uh, do I have room if the VMA collapses a whole percent? So if this whole line fell down, if my air voids filled up in the in the field. With dust, do I have room? And that happens when the aggregates are transported. So, so the other point that's important is I want to be to the minimum and to the left of this curve. Because the moment I start getting on the right portion of this curve, I have issues with now I'm pushing my rocks apart with asphalt. And that is really, really important to understand and stay away from this portion of the curve. You can create VMA that way but you just created something that is highly unstable and probably will rut. Okay, uh, BFA, now I'm gonna fill, I'm gonna take the VMA and I'm gonna fill that VMA with asphalt. And I just wanna know what percent of that 15.8% VMA am I filling with asphalt? And that's what I'm doing right here. I like to be, um, the numbers typically today are like 65, 75. I like to be in the, I like to be in the 75, 85 range. I like to fill it up with asphalt. Um, not here selling asphalt today. I just know that asphalt is absolutely critical, um, and we and we and we haven't put enough in our mixtures. We've dried them up. And and here I enter in 5.6 percent asphalt content, and I see I'm getting like a a 73 uh, or so percent BMA there, or BFA. Again, that's the percent of my voids that I have filled with asphalt. So I like that, that's a good mixture. Uh, I'm gonna look at my, my dust asphalt uh, proportion and I'm gonna bring that up now. And my dust asphalt proportion, I just wanna do a final check. Uh, one six is where we used to be. 
Uh, I do not like one six. <clears throat> it's way too high. But in this case, why is my dust proportion so high in this one when I had so much asphalt in it? What in the world's going on? Well, I do this to show you I used a lot of dust. So in this case, I have a, a, a heavy mastic with a lot of dust in it. And, and I'm approaching that number. So I may look good in all these other parameters, but I may be really high here. So this is one that's really important to, to look at. Again, for me, if, I'm, if I've got a mixture that I'm loving, and it's gonna be compactable, and, and some of my favorite mixtures are, are probably gonna be in this one, two or less. And that's just me. Last thing I wanna look at is, uh, I've gotta look at my N initial. I wanna make sure I'm not too high above this line right here. <clears throat> and and the reason I look at that at this low level of gyrations is because I want to make sure I'm below about 89 or 90 percent. I don't want it to be uh, unstable. <clears throat> and and but the other thing this can do is I can also look at it at this mid range of gyrations and understand am I able to meet my compaction requirement in the field? Yes, I can use the gyratory to understand potential field compaction based upon my lift thickness, and that's a that's another webinar in itself. With that, do I meet the specification of my gradation, my ag properties, my liquid properties, volumetrics, and so on? If not, rinse and repeat. Could be one to two week process, depends how fast you are if you have to get restocked on aggregates. Otherwise, you move on, you do a final test for what we call moisture sensitivity testing. And this is just making a pill that or a sample that we're trying to understand. And if there's my aggregates and asphalt sticking together well, I'm going to look at a what I call conditioned. Uh, conditioned is typically going to be running through a freeze and a thaw cycle. Well, actually, we'll put water into the sample and freeze it and then thaw it versus an unconditioned tensile strength. And then when I do that, I'm looking uh, physically, I want to look to see if the asphalt actually came off the aggregate too. The, the visual is so important. Uh, often overlooked, but but I'm trying to understand at the end of the day um, that this is TSR ratio. I'm hoping that it's uh, typically the, the value we use is it's at least an 80, uh, an 80.8 ratio or 80% or above. Finally, I'm going to do this uh, design finalization. You see here like a design submittal. I'm going to prepare, submit samples. In the world we live in today, we may have to run some performance test on it. Um, somewhat rare right now, but boy, it's coming online quickly. <clears throat> uh, this is just a picture of an SB, uh, an SCV test over here on the left. Um, <clears throat> this is a typical, uh, this is one I use for Kentucky, but you're going to see what a typical submittal looks like. The project ID, name, you have a state number, federal number, the job number, what's the asphalt source, what's the aggregate source. All these things that the DOT tracks in their in their uh, limbs or their uh, or their their their, um, their materials uh, tracking systems that they have. All of these different sources, they want to understand blend percentages. What I'm using, all my different trials I used, volumetric properties. What is my optimum blend? And all of this is to get me to what I call a JMF or a job mix formula. From lab to field, we're ready to take it from our lab and now run out to the uh, plant. And with that, Joe, I'm going to let you do a poll question, then we'll wrap this up with sort of um, uh, where we're going with performance testing. Very good. So, how much increase in cracking resistance in either lab or field can you expect to get from a single dose of 38 millimeter ACE XP polymer fiber? Go ahead and, and vote on that. And uh, Phil, uh, you, you mentioned something earlier about VMA and why it's important. And you know, from the standpoint, uh, uh, you know, a strong indicator of uh, having more uh, liquid asphalt in there. Uh, comment on what we've learned in the lab with uh, different percentages of liquid AC to different dosages of ACE XP. Um, it becomes critical in performance. Uh, that we have not a dry mix. We need the liquid to reinforce, correct? Well, absolutely. Um, you've got to have a, a certain amount of asphalt in there just to hang onto the rock. And if you look at a mixture and the mixture looks brown to begin with, um, there's not enough, what we, the old timers would call it, um, and, I, and I like to use this term, film thickness. There's not enough asphalt film to, in there to really even hold the mixture together. And what, what, uh, what we, quickly find out with using a, something like a fiber. And again, this fi fibers guys have been around since the 90s. 
um, and even earlier than that. But whether you look at the federal highways use and in the reports that's been done through uh, NCHRP and TRB, and different things, fibers work and they work really well, but they highly rely upon the asphalt binder to be able to uh, to be able to get their strength. So if I just mix fibers with rock, it does me nothing. Um, but I all of a sudden, if I put the fibers in with the liquid asphalt, now that now the fibers begin to act like uh, muscle. If you want to think about that, you're 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 bulking your mix up. You're adding three dimensional reinforcing. So it is important to have a, a good asphalt content and not a dry mixture. Uh, it makes a big difference. And so you get you frankly get more out of your your dollar, more out of your fiber when you're doing that. Okay, Joe. Absolutely. And so uh, when we think of a dry mixture, um, you, you know, we still may be improving it this 30 to 50 percent uh, uh, with regards to uh, cracking resistance, uh, specifically ideal CT that we're going to be looking at. But we've run all the tests on our all cracking tests that you're going to mention coming up on, on the product. And that percentage is pretty uh, is pretty uh, consistent throughout all the testing. Well, yeah. And, and and it was shown very well in in the federal highway study that that and it was even using a polyester fiber which is nowhere near what we're looking at today with aramid but even in the polyester fiber uh was uh, was one of the top performers in cracking resistance on the accelerated load facility at turner fairbank so joe if you don't mind uh, take uh, finish up that question i'll jump right back in on balanced mix design well i think we're okay here so it is 30 to 50 percent with a single dose i okay. just wanted to point out when you go to a double <clears throat> dose or a triple dose, those numbers will continue to increase. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're looking for uh, something with a, a, you know, a little bit more uh, crack resistance, uh, we can talk about putting whatever dosage of uh, aramid fiber or ASEXP in the mix as you want. But standard testing would show 30 to 50 percent. Go ahead, Phil. Okay, Joe. So, <clears throat> looking at the looking at the time and everything, I realize I'm going to run over just a bit. Um, bear with me and, and we'll make this worth your while. Uh, so how in the world does a balanced mix design fit into what we have today? Why do we use volumetrics to begin with? It makes a system biddable. Uh, it makes it easy to bid. So what happens when I go to say, let me just use a pure balanced mix design with no volumetrics. One contractor may bid one number, another one, that is great. That's absolutely wonderful, but contractors wouldn't even know how to bid that very well right now. And it gets very confusing. And, and that type of stuff can be done for private or warranty type of work, but it doesn't work well for the low bid system. So it's important that we, that we thread these needles and we go through this very cautiously and we move an industry from volumetrics to balanced mix design. So you're gonna see a lot of that out there. I like volumetrics, even if all the, the, the gloves come off, <clears throat> even if the gloves come off, it's going to be important for me to be able to use initial volumetric analysis because I want to know, I don't want to be spending my money running these expensive tests um, if I have messed up on my VMA to begin with and I've pushed my aggregates apart. So the volumetrics are a teacher or a tutor that's going to lead us to the proper answers on the back end that's going to allow us to verify. And then I can go back in and scientifically or through an engineering approach, uh, adjust my, uh, with knowledge now, I can adjust those parameters to achieve the best. Um, and does that mean I'm going to be locked in eventually one day to 3% uh, air voids? No, I think you're going to see that come off. I do think you're going to see either us separating the asphalt and aggregate bidding instead of it bidding by the eight hot mix ton. I think you could see what some states have moved to on bidding asphalt and aggregate separately. Uh, it takes that incentive away from the contractor to have to remove asphalt to make money. Uh, another thing is, is I think you could go off of an index to where you'll pay a contractor a, for a minimum asphalt content, but then as he ends up using more, you adjust his pay for that. Uh, we, we've got to take some of that risk off the contractor. So again, a balanced mix design is this using the performance test on condition samples, looking at different distresses, and consideration of the mix aging and also location of the payment structure. But we that's the end, end result, but we do that, we gotta start off with volumetrics. So that's why we, we, we say then and now, you don't throw the baby out with the bath water. So a few slides to walk through that. Um, our roads today, uh, we, we get a scorecard of a D in the US, why is that? Well, we have massive amount of roadways wearing out where we have been lack of funding 
and so on. And this pandemic uh, is going to continue to take money away from that. So we have we have got to get smarter with what we're doing. But the other thing, the other flip side of that is we have seen traffic sort of decrease since the 9-11 event, the amount of traffic. However, um, the um, um, oh, I've got my I've got my numbers backwards there, guys. The uh, the I just now realized this. The uh, the red and the <laughs> the red and the I've done it again, Joe. The red and the blue are reversed. <laughs> the 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 volume of traffic, the the blue line, this bottom one is the volume of of, of traffic. Okay, it has uh, it has it has gone up and then come back down. However, the amount of loadway on our highway system is since 1970 is now pushing near 700 percent increase and it continues to go up even though that our volume of traffic in certain areas on rural highways have gone down what's that mean we are loading them loading our highways with trucks we have moved from rail to more trucks and so on again balanced mix design we're moving between durability and stability but it's so important to understand that that we we do this and we've got to have some type of performance testing and it's got to be testing that's quick to do and and easy to do it's relatively easy to do and it may not always be the cheapest thing to do but we cannot continue to put down millions of dollars in assets in Kentucky that'd be about 800 million on a, on the highway uh, system we cannot continue to put down that much in a year or in the, even the city of Lexington that that has like 80 million a year without some type of um, review uh, of the potential performance. Uh, it's just not, um, it is just not uh, us being, a, we, we've got to be better stewards is what I'm getting at. It, and, and it's not responsible of us to do that. Payment distresses that we're seeing, it, it's cracking guys. The top four out of there is cracking, 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 cracking. Raveling is related to low asphalt content. Rutting, we have no issues. We can talk about the different types of cracking. One crack is not another crack. They're all different types of cracks from the from the fatigue to reflective thermal and, and, and just low temperature thermal. The one that tends to be wearing us out right now is this one called thermal block. That's where we have under asphalted mixes. We're seeing an awful lot of that. The base is okay, but it's a lot of top down. <clears throat> Rutting, moisture damage, raveling or other issues that we can run into. I just want to remind everybody, SuperPay intended to actually use what they call level one, two, and three. Level one was just volumetrics. Level one is just what we covered for the past hour, 45 minutes. That's exactly what I covered. Levels two and three was performance testing, but never, uh, we were so excited with the performance we were getting and no rutting, we just said, we don't need it. Well, we fooled ourselves. Uh, we really do need it. And now all of a sudden you're seeing that coming back. And what we call balance mix design is really what what uh, we call level two and three here. Because even with level two and three, we could change our, um, that allowed us to go and, and use lower air voids. Okay, limitations of volumetric design, they rely heavily on that VA or PA parameter I mentioned. We're talking about percents within percents. Uh, VMA is only aggregate or only accurate as, as your bulk gravities highly subjective on some of these binder quality effective additives um, i can use ppa reob rejuvenators but i can put too much of those in there and now cause another issue i can use a, a good amount of wrap but i can use too much of it or use wrap without modifiers or without fiber or without things to soften it and i can have a problem there um, we've got other things today and 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 so Joe if you and Steve were to come to me years ago and with super pave and say hey um, I have an aramid fiber I would look straight at you and say well um, what does it do to my volumetrics does it help VMA well guess what guys if it doesn't fix that I don't need it in today's world I know VMA is not the answer for everything and I rely on other tests so there was not even room in our system for these other products such as polymers, aramid fibers, warming. SuperPave wasn't built for it. SuperPave was really built just to help us um, get our basics for, for bidding purposes down. <clears throat> Binder quality has changed. We continue to have to uh, reduce sulfur content in the, in the refining industry, produce more fuel. Um, you know, all of these factors play into our balanced mix design. Again, we've had to modify SuperPave uh, we've lowered gyrations. 
we have uh, we we have the recycle materials. We, you know, again, you look at the additives, you look at the balance mixes. All these things are now modifying what I call modifications uh, to try to improve what we have. We could talk a lot about lower gyration levels. Um, we've already really talked about that. There's no use beating on that one right now. Uh, there's just a big trend to move towards lower gyrations, but be careful. Uh, you go too low on that. And for instance, if I use 50 gyrations on a large stone mixture, uh, I'm not gonna get enough compactive energy in that. So that is why, again, balanced mix design goes way past um, just looking at volumetrics only. Volumetrics is important, but now I'm gonna add on some testing. So what's that look like? I may look at some of these cracking tests. If I'm in Minnesota, I may use a, a, a test that's not pictured here called a DCT. It's really good for the lower temperature area uh, that we just don't experience in the South. Whereas an overlay tester, also not pictured, uh, has worked well for uh, the state of Texas. More uh, higher end tests, such as beam fatigue, works great for higher end mixtures or for uh, research purposes. But what we're trying to do is come up with really simple things in the field where I either take something like a SCB or my favorite, the ideal CT, because I take something very quick and compacted right out of the device and put it on there. SVECD, another very important one, but a more, a more research level. Uh, these two tests here are bending beam and SVECD. Again, are critical tests. We just don't have an ability to be able to do that at, at a plant level. On a rutting side, um, I even look at a device like this and it looks huge. Uh, and, and whether I use, look at this one or the, the one on the right called the APA Junior, uh, Smart Tracker, I love the Smart Tracker. Absolutely wonderful device, too big to put in a trailer. However, uh, a great device to use on my design side at a contractor's lab or a contractor's uh, or, or at the DOT, but go put that in the trailer, it gets difficult. Well, I don't necessarily have to do that at, at the field level. Maybe I do that at the design level and I use an index test, such as now they're coming up with an ideal RT test that Fuji's worked on uh, for a running indicator. Uh, again, these are index tests. Um, and if, if you're gonna go back to sort of understand the direct relationship, we gotta go back to fundamental testing. So keep that in mind, buyer beware on what we call index tests, is that they are more related to performance, um, but they don't dive all the way into the details. And, I, and I'll give you a very quick example on, an, on the, like the ideal CT. Um, NCAT did a great presentation yesterday on the update of their track. And, and one thing just to rely, to look at things such as SCB and ideal CT, these are not repeated loads, okay? This is just a static load where I've been to break things apart. So I may or may not pick up on all the added benefits of the polymer being able to recover um, or an aramid fiber being able to relax. But are they a great indicator and are they taking us in a much better place? Absolutely they are. Does Do the polymer mixtures and aramid fiber mixtures look better with them? Absolutely they do. So just keep that in mind. Um, I'm not going to really hit all of this uh, in here. I'm, I want to move um, uh, on through to a couple of more slides and then get right into the testing. Bottom line, it's a fun time to be in the asphalt industry. Um, keep in mind that their poor old binder spec, the PAVDSR, was meant for unmodified binders and it was a catch-all. It's just not stout enough to take care of what we're doing today. That means that, that there's only so much that we can do with aggregate tests and asphalt tests. We've got to test the final product and contractors eyes and DOT's eyes are being opened for the first time that they can actually now see potential performance of their mixtures by, by using tests such as ideal CT and the Hamburg test. 1919, um, we've been doing this now for over 101 years. When this guy here named Hubbard was working with a guy named Field at Asphalt Institute and they developed this Hubbard fill stability test. Looks pretty rudimentary, but folks, we've had 101 years to implement, implement something. And, and, and I swear, if we hadn't come up with what we were doing, I think I was about ready to go back to this test. So I am so glad to see us having these higher sophisticated tests that we can do today, but we can do it simply and do it at a local level. Today, we have things such as a Hamburg APA overlay test. You get all these different tests. Bottom line, performance tests allow us to verify our estimates, design and check for potential distresses. We can go through and do custom designs for specific loadings. Maybe I'm working on a Love's truck stop. Maybe I'm working on a pilot 
truck trucks. So maybe I'm working on a on a, a school driveway where they're loading with buses. I can, or maybe I have a tollway where where they where they're coming in and having to stop. It allows me to think out of the box with new materials and modifiers. A lot of tests there on the right, guys. A lot of tests. To everyone out there, just to give you a general picture and a partial picture uh, of what we have, the, the two tests that I like to move forward with is simply a Hamburg test and, a, and an ideal CT test on the right. It gives me a quick picture of rutting and cracking. And if I can't pass these two tests, I don't have much of a, a need to move further. Even 10 years ago, um, I was doing work at Asphalt Institute, and, and as I had the opportunity to work with the good folks up in Lexington, um, and with a with a Kentucky uh, with a Kentucky uh, KYTC study, and and what this was was a was a simple mixture that we took, uh, very similar to what I've been talking about, and I began to load that mixture. I just added more asphalt to it in the laboratory. Look what happened. I added over six tenths asphalt to that mixture, and it didn't move on the rutting side, and it didn't even move on the cracking side. And that's using a couple of older tests. Once I began to add a lot of asphalt, I began to, this mixture couldn't handle much. So this mixture would be very hard to balance, as I would call it. Even though I'm saying it's balanced here, I can get more compaction, but I can't add much more asphalt. Why? Because I was already at a VMA level that wouldn't let me move much past it. But look at that. I added six tenths asphalt and I didn't even move the needle. That's how deficient some of these mixtures are. The plan that's drawn, I've got two graphics that make your eyes go frost, so you may, these are good ones to take a picture of. Uh, this one's from an NCHRP 20-07 project. The plan was to try to balance or do a performance engineering design to begin to uh, add more asphalt content to improve the durability without giving up stability. And that's where you see these two crossing. No different than this line here. I wanna be careful when I cross too far and I don't wanna end up over here where now I've added so much asphalt content, I've got great durability, but it'll just shove in it when it goes to the field. So I wanna be in this middle range. And by the way, there's sort of a third dimension to this. Again, whether adding fibers or polymers that we can do, things are not just stiff or soft, they can also be elastic. And that's important to realize that this is not just two dimensions, there's a third dimension that we're really not showing you, that we, we can get the best of both worlds, but we just have to use different materials. You gotta love this one. Um, this is this is a typical, when we talk about balanced mix design, this is typical volumetrics here on the left. And then I go into performance testing to see if I, if I actually passed it. The next design is to do the same thing, but now um, what I'm doing is I may adjust my proportions and I'm, and I'm again, instead of doing a whole redesign, I'm just adjusting. Now, once I go over to this last one, this is really where I wanna get to with balanced mix design is I'm going in here and, I, and I'll go through and I'll perform my rutting and cracking test way up front. And I'm, and I'm making these adjustments. Now, I still would add a box in here. I've gotta have some target to where I've done some type of volumetric analysis to know what I'm doing, uh, to have some indicator. And then that helps me eliminate some of my variables. And then I jump right into all of this. And, and, and I, but the key is this box here in the upper right that conduct my performance rutting and cracking test earlier in the process. And why do I do volumetric again down here? In order to have something to adjust in the field. It's important, I've gotta have something to be able to perform quality control on. I can do that somewhat with ideal CT, but I may not know how to adjust my asphalt content, which will drive it. So that's why it's important to have volumetric analysis. Take this one, Joe, and then we'll wrap it up with some rutting and cracking slides and uh, we'll be done for the day. Thanks, Phil, appreciate it. Uh, let's, see. let's launch this one. Way here. Okay, so a little teaser that'll lead us into uh, part two of the webinar series, which will be more product focused using uh, our uh, asphalt uh, products uh, from Surface Tech, but also combining it with balanced mix design and how do we achieve some of these uh, better performing uh, mixes. And one of those uh, products we'll be talking about is Army. But as an introduction to that, what is it? Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, start uh, voting there, and uh, we'll see where we go. 
You know, Phil, it, uh, you know, you raise a great point. Um, we're not going to get the, a balanced mixed design slash performance testing without the volumetrics. Now, there may be a point where some of the volumetrics that we're tracking right now become less important, uh, but we have to be where we are in order to move it forward. That would be your opinion, correct? That's right. That's right. Um, it, 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 you know, again, um, I love the movie uh, Cars and uh, a famous quote from um, the tow truck, tow mater, says that you can't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. And as he drives backwards, looking through his rearview mirror and uh, or through his side mirrors, and it's important that we do that. And and the volumetrics help us to under sort of it it it, it helps us to interpret where we're going with um, with the performance testing. So yeah. So the, the answer to the poll question, um, most of you got it right. It uh, uh, the Army product is an aramid reinforced mix interlayer. Uh, it is a plant made paper laid one inch asphalt interlayer. And you're going to see some numbers from Phil on typical HMA, but it's anywhere from seven to 10 times more crack resistant than a standard HMA mix. And we're achieving that by controlling the mix design using more of a fine aggregate mix, which Phil has talked about today is his preference. So a 475 millimeter mix and uh, obviously a little bit higher content than uh, liquid AC. And in most cases, a double dose of aramid fiber or ASEXP polymer fiber. So with that, Phil, I will throw it back to you and let's uh, wrap this thing up. Yeah, let's let's take this home. So I'm gonna show you just a couple of tests. And again, we'll move because of the um, of the uh, of the time, uh, we'll we'll move through these quickly. And, and uh, thank you everybody for staying with us on this. A lot of information, but hopefully uh, one, it's free um, minus your time. And then two, hopefully uh, you've enjoyed this uh, sponsor session by Surface Tech to give you an Asphalt 101 sort of then and now. Um, yes, I, I do like uh, <laughs> my good friend at, at, at Instratech, um, Brian O'Toole sent me some Batman symbols and you want to bet that I put those on my equipment and <laughs> we <laughs> got to have fun with that. Ideal CT, the, the concept of that is, is it, it's, this test has been around for a long time. And we call it a TSR, just an indirect tensile strength test. But we typically would stop it just about up here as you break over the curve after you come down about 10%. You begin to run it longer. And now, I mean, we, we have a technology to, to measure this area underneath the curve. We have the technology to measure the slope. And by doing these things, uh, while I'm not doing a direct fracture energy, I can, I can measure this energy, uh, an index, I want to call it, and then dividing it by this slope. And I begin to understand my materials and how they work. And the slope, if I have a, a really flat slope, it means my material is wanting to stick together and be cohesive. And the asphalt's adhesive to the aggregate. If it's really brittle and it's really steep, my mixture is breaking very, very quickly and it's way too stiff. So by com combining again, the, the energy here with that slope, I, I get a factor and the SCB test works just the same way. And, and again, another very good test. I just prefer this one because it's easy and you don't have to cut it. And uh, I work with Fuji on this one at ASTM when we were moving it through the, the committee, uh, very thoroughly reviewed. Does it need more work? Absolutely like anything, but a very good starting point And one we continually the, to put on. This is probably the most popular test ASTM has, has put out in, in years. Um, I'm just going to, I've already talked about that. Um, again, as I begin to load the sample, this is just a slide here from Fuji. Um, as I begin to load it, uh, you'll see that I'll reach a point where the mixture cracks. And once I begin to fracture it, um, that fracture will grow through the sample until I break it all the way in two. Again, as that one was run at 25 C, you do adjust to this, this test per your climate. So don't run all your Hamburgs at 50 C adjust it in your climate. If you're up north, run it at 40 or 45 C in the south, run it at 50, 55. Again, there's there's ways to do that and, and go back to the original work on these uh, the, that has been done. Um, don't just run the ideal CT at 25. If you're in the if you're in the desert southwest, run it higher. And I've done that. I've run it up um, I've run it up at 35 C and then getting very reliable numbers out of it. I've run it colder if I'm up in the north. Again, adjust these adjust these test for your temperature. 
I'm going to make samples using a gyratory. Um, we use 7% air voids as a common. I think we always use seven because that's what we always hope to be at in the field, although we're really closer to eight. But some areas are at 7% with they have more of what they call percent within limit spec. So again, 7% air voids is just one that we commonly use in the laboratory. Um, this is just telling you how the test runs, different tests that we have there to run it on. I'm going to show you some results coming up here in just a moment. Um, I'm going to see if this is a play, and hopefully, you know, folks will see it. There's nothing magic to this. Uh, this is just a, a, a just a very quick video just to show you this test breaking. But you get an idea of of this of this mixture really trying to hold together versus it just going up and peaking and shattering. So how do you design a mix that is stable and durable? Well, it's all the different components. You got to know where you're going with it. I'm going to use some slides from Fuji to talk about just the CT index and how it responds to RAP and RAS. Um, a good range of this, if, if the SCB test has a range of like zero to 20, the ideal CT test can have a range of, let's say zero to, um, in this case, maybe zip to maybe a hundred for common mixes. The, the army mix Joe was talking about is more like in the 750 or higher range. But in, in this case, what we're looking at is I take a, a virgin mixture and I begin to add wrap and I, and oh, what happened here? Well, it's not that the wrap is bad. Again, it's because I didn't probably put enough asphalt in there. Look at Fuji's asphalt content here. It's only 5%. Um, now I can go in here and I can begin to lower my performance grade, my low temperature, and I should improve the cracking. And guess what it does? So now I've got a test that, that can help me understand relationship to recycle materials, relationship to binder type. Look what it does on binder content. Now I begin to add more binder in there and all of a sudden uh, it's responding to that. Well, that's great too. Now I've got a test that's sensitive to that. It's sensitive to aging. 24 hours could represent a mixture that's been in place for, for uh, 10, uh, 10, 15 years. Um, maybe depending on where you're at, maybe it's eight years, but you get the idea. It's important hey, to realize go back to that, go back uh -huh. that last number. Um, OAC 6.3 percent. Oh, I'm sorry. Asphalt there. Yeah, so, yeah, that's right. That's uh, why those so, numbers were a factor different almost. Yeah, let, let me let me go back here. <clears throat> and so when I when I go back and look at these numbers over here, how in the world did I get up to 350? What I've done is I've taken this number, this this optimum asphalt content, and I've really increased it. And and this one has an optimum asphalt content of the 7022 at 6.3 percent so you're right this one think of it as more of a balanced design now i've really increased the asphalt content and drop off so thank you joe for mentioning that um this graph is just to show you that uh on just one project where this is this is recorded tra cracking on your left with a wrap ras mix versus a virgin asphalt mix with no wrap and ras and then how it responds in the ct ideal ct index where you have a low value versus a high and this is actual plant mix compared to actual cracking on a highway. So these are important tests, guys. Um, aramid fiber. What happens when I put the aramid fiber in? I can go from this 90 value that I've seen in Kentucky all day long on, on sort of what their mixtures were last year to putting, uh, to putting that in there and I can jump that value up. Maybe a, a single dose, and this is a single dose of fiber and then a double dose, a single dose and a double dose of fiber. Actually, if I had the control mixture in here, the control would probably be down here close to 50. Um, and uh, so, so this is the, the type of impressive stuff that we can do with even aramid fibers. And why do we do that? Uh, if I don't have polymer or different additives available locally, I can instantly flip a switch on the plant and get this type of response. And even with polymer today, uh, polymer's limited and has to be compatible with the asphalt. So again, polymer's still important, but you have more options than just polymer asphalt. You have aramid fiber or aramid fiber plus polymer. Um, <clears throat> Hamburg Wheel Tracker allows me to measure uh, fill performance in the laboratory by simulating a rutting environment underwater different equipment. There's two basic accepted devices, one called a smart tracker or a or basic Hamburg wheel tracker that we use out there today that looks more like this. There's other folks who make versions of it. Uh, Troxler makes one, Cooper Cox makes one, Controls makes one. Uh, there's one by Infratest and so many others. The other common one that we see 
is, is one that's a more narrow design, which is called an APA Junior. That's the same thing, just a different looking box. Ashto T3D24, I'll refer you to that on how to run it. Typically tested at 50, but I beg you to, to change, but uh, per your climate, we run it out to 20,000 passes. But one thing I do want to say is that there's another uh, uh, thing that I'll throw on here on the end uh, that I think is important to do, and then we'll be done. Um, we're going to prepare our samples. We'll, we'll trim them. There's very little trimming done on this. We'll put the samples in this mold. We'll tighten it down. Uh, if you don't have this type of or, or, or uh, plastic mold or rubber mold, you can use a, a mold that uh, you make out of plaster of Paris. Conditioning the sample uh, in the in the device um, in, in what the specification says, maximum of one hour. You start the test. It records the data, makes it pretty easy. And it actually, you can even look at the stripping inflection point. Well, what is that? If this mixture were running over a number of passes on the bottom down here, if this mixture were running and it just rutted, it would go way out to the right over here. But when stripping kicks in and the asphalt debonds from the aggregate, it will take a dive. Whether if it dives early, you got a stripping problem. If it dives here, you got a potential stripping problem. If it dives way out here, you're probably okay. So stripping inflection point is a good indicator. And I argue that we do not need a TSR test in place once we move to this Hamburg uh, wheel tracker. We can get more quick data and even better accurate data quicker than using a TSR. There's a new test that there are a, a new twist to that test, and that's where uh, in some of the papers that's been out there, uh, we can use a thing called a rutting resistance index. And you simply take your, your uh, passes that you're going to see here, and you're going to multiply it one minus your rut depth, where rut depth is in inches. Let me show you how that works. I can also uh, use a, a predictive, and this is rutting has been been able to pre be predicted for years. Uh, this is a number amount of dust. This is my value in, from a masker test. This is my uh, a sieve at my 16, my BFA, my percent binder. And I can begin to use that to predict rutting. Well, that's pretty cool because what that means by using a rutting resistance index that's coming directly from the Hamburg test, where I simply took my number of passes times um, uh, one minus my rut depth. So I'm gonna give you an example. If I had a uh, 20,000 passes and I had a half inch of rutting, uh, that would be 20,000 times a half, which would give me 10,000. Well, now I can take that rutting resistance index, but look at this. This is predict. This is measured on the left and this is predicted on the bottom. How cool is that, that I can even predict it without even running the test? I use the test to verify. So again, I think we're gonna move away from um, a lot less reliance on VMA to some of these cooler tools. We still have to have VMA and things for, for control. Uh, this is just a box plot here to show you. I'm going to pull it all together for our balanced mix design. Uh, actually, this is one, uh, Joe, I ran on Aramid Fiber, where I looked at a uh, single dose, a double dose. On the, on the gray is a single dose, double dose is blue. And then I use a 7022 where I use a single dose and I use a double dose. Notice here, my average CT index, I wanted to be above 100. So I want to be in this range above this red box here. I also, for my average rutting index, I want to be to the right of this line. So what mixes look best? Anything that's in this box. And if I want the best performer, it's up here at the top. These two at the bottom, I'm, I'm putting myself at risk and I don't feel that lucky today as, as, Clint, as Clint Eastwood may uh, explain. And um, with that, I would much rather have something in, in these higher boxes up here. What's interesting is the double dose of the Aramid at 6422 outperformed the single dose in a 7022. Again, material combinations, folks, it doesn't have to be complicated. We can keep this simple with these tests we have today. Pulling it all together just for a moment, we talked about liquid asphalt. We talked about the, uh, we, we talked about um, aggregate. We talked about overview of compaction. We talked about how you put it together. We did a lot today. We selected an aggregate structure. We selected an optimum asphalt content. We looked at volumetrics and then we moved it into how do we adjust that with balanced mix design, you know, and, and where this has come from. Then we took a dive into Ideal CT, a dive into Hamburg. And with that, I want to thank you all today. And um, 
Uh, Joe, do you have, uh, and I'll move on over here to, to, to this and let you uh, wrap this up. Thank you to everyone out there and, and appreciate you joining us today. Sorry for running over just a bit. Yeah, so thanks, Phil. Uh, as we wrap this up today, I uh, just want to uh, point out that this was the first of three uh, webinars. The second one uh, will take off from where we left off today, and uh, uh, Phil and I will make sure that uh, we readdress the whole last portion of his uh, talk today on Ideal CT in Hamburg, uh, because this uh, Good, Better, Best and Test program that we're going to go through uh, that uh, Surface Tech has launched uh, squarely uses the Ideal CT and the Hamburg Wheel Tracker as the cornerstone of the, the test methodology for figuring out just how crack resistant is your current, uh, are your current mixes. Uh, that is the biggest problem in the industry right now. We're trying to address, uh, address crack issues, but so many people don't know how crack resistant their mixes are to start with. So we're going to walk through all of that. We're going to balance it out using both, uh, uh, you know, Ideal CT for Crack and Hamburg. And you're going to see that uh, there is a great uh, tool out there in the use of our products to help balance these mixes to accomplish what we're trying to achieve. Uh, the next slide, uh, part three, uh, we are uh, going to dive into more of the producer side of using our product. Um, how does it go in? What equipment's needed? What does the dosages look like? Um, and, uh, you know, what kind of plant training is involved? The whole package with regards to uh, moving our product into the industry. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, sign off. And uh, Steve, if you're still there, did you have any closing comments? Yes, Joe, thanks very much. And Phil, thanks for the day. It was an excellent presentation. Looking forward for Thank number you, two and, and also number three as we uh, move through this series. I think for everybody on the on the call today, on the session today, it's important to understand that uh, you know a company like Surface Tech in hosting this, it also kind of connects us to an organization that is looking to be your partner as far as solutions and all things mixed design. We are very committed to that. I think that uh, that's really important for everybody on the session to understand. It's a, a tenant of the organization to really do its diligence appropriately in order to then bring solutions to the market that we feel are very, very solid, very sound. Um, and with that, I uh, just want to say stay uh, diligent with regard to all of our our, our distancing and and uh, uh, watch to try to beat this curve and and uh, get us all back to work in a responsible and effective manner and thank you very much for the day and look forward to session two and Joe you'll be sending um, um, out the PDHs and um, yeah and if, final, if there's any follow uh, okay yeah, if there's any follow-up so, questions uh, we'll answer that too yep. yeah there there are some questions there that we need to get out which we'll do Phil. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the follow-up email should come out tomorrow. We will have a copy of the video presentation, as you saw. Uh, it also has uh, the links built in for the next two sessions, so you can register right there if you haven't done that. Um, and there's also uh, several videos of our products and the dosing tied to that. Uh, so that if you can review those, it'll be a step ahead for uh, uh, series number two. So thanks so much, everybody. Uh, have a, uh, a safe uh, uh, weekend, and uh, we'll uh, see you here back in about two weeks. Take care. Thank you.